Good evening. Uh, we'll start the Town of Holliston Planning Board meeting for Thursday, February 4th. Uh, it's a little after 7 o'clock. And first, I need to read a quick paragraph. Pursuit to the governor's order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL, uh, C 38 paragraph 20, as well as the select board's emergency order dated 316 2020. The planning board will be using remote participation for this meeting. The audio of this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the town's web page within 24 hours in accordance with the governor's emergency action requirements of keeping the public informed of actions during this meeting. I would ask that all participants remotely attending this meeting Please state your name for identification purposes each time you speak throughout the meeting and your address. At this time, I will do a roll call um, for board members, starting with uh, David Thorne. Josh Santoro. Uh, Karen. Karen Apuzo Langton, present. Uh, Scott. Scott Furkler, present. Okay. And Jason. Jason Santos present. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and before we start, uh, I guess the first thing we wanted to address is the time we're going to end tonight. Um, and if there's board members that have a time that they'd like uh, to make a motion to in regards to time, um, what time we'd end tonight. Um, is there somebody that would like to make a motion to a time? Dave, Jason, um, we've, we've been ending at 9.30, and I think we've every evening been uh, able to cover quite a lot of material. I have no objections to continuing to end at 9.30, and, uh, you know, especially out of respect for those who have to get up in the morning and go to work. So I would propose 9.30. That sounds great. Okay. So, and you, okay, so you made a motion, yeah. and Josh has seconded it. Uh, I guess all in favor? Uh, I guess starting with uh, Karen. Karen. Aye. Scott? Aye. Okay. Uh, Jason? Jason, aye. Okay. Aye, aye, Josh. Okay. All right. David, aye. Okay, great. So we will end at 930. Um, first, we'll start with approvals, uh, approval of minutes. Uh, I don't know if anybody had any questions in regards to the minutes. Or if no questions, if somebody would like to motion. I have them here if somebody. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes dated January 21st, 2020. Okay, thank you, Karen. Karen has made a motion. Do I have a second? Jason, second. Okay, Jason has made a second. All in favor? I guess we'll start with Scott. Aye. Okay, uh, Karen? Aye. Okay, uh, Jason? Aye. Uh, Josh? Aye. Okay, and David, aye. Okay. All right. The minutes. Um, next would be approvals, not required subdivisions. Um, you have two plans in your packet. Uh, one is for the um, Nickerson Farm on Highland Street and South Street in Ashland. It's a plan that has to be signed by both yourselves and the Ashland Planning Board. Um, it is, uh, most of the land is in Holliston. And if you'll recall from a recent town meeting action, there's gonna be a, um, an agricultural preservation restriction placed on the parcels. Um, and Mr. Nickerson is reserving his existing house and I think it's five acres. Um, the application was filed by the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. Um, and the plan meets all the dimensional requirements of Holliston zoning. So I would recommend endorsement. Okay. All right. So we'll just make a motion to that effect. Or do sure. And Josh time? has a pen okay. in his hand. So I suggest that the motion be to enable the agent to. Okay. Is fine. The agent make the motion. motion to enable the agent to sign off on the. Uh, Nickerson property subdivision. Okay, Karen has made a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Josh has made a, has seconded that. Uh, all in favor? I guess we'll start with uh, Scott. Aye. Uh, Karen. Aye. 
Uh, Jason. Aye. Josh. Aye. Okay. Great. Uh, the second plan that you have in your packets is um, a, a division in a residential neighborhood. It is the existing Chamberlain Pines uh, Tennis and Swim Club. Um, it's been sold and uh, the applicant is proposing three single family homes and they've been through the Board of Health and through the Conservation Commission. Um, so what you have is our three uh, residential lots, uh, parcel borders, the agricultural B zone on one side and the other is in the um, residential district. And so you note the zone split on the plan, uh, but essentially they're gonna be removing all the features that exist on the property currently. Um, apparently marketing your Olympic sized swimming pool is not a good thing. Um, so it's, it's all coming down um, and three houses are being okay. proposed. So again, it meets all the requirements of zoning um, and Scott has approved septic plans. So they're very confident about the lines that they're establishing. Um, and the plan meets the requirements of the bylaw. Okay, all right. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion to that effect? And it goes a bygone era. Uh, <laughs> True enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, motion to, uh, right, we're, we're empowering Josh again, are we? To yes. sign the uh, subdivision for number 84 Chamberlain Street. Okay. Karen's made a motion. Do I have a second? Jason second. Okay, Jason seconded. All in favor? I guess we'll start with uh, Karen. Hi. All right, so Scott. Aye. Jason. Aye. All right, Josh. Aye. Aye, and David, aye, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Okay. Which one is your Do you want me to do budget real quick or sure. do you want to move on yeah. to business? Yeah, no, um, Travis um, and I met with the finance committee on Tuesday evening. Um, and I think I said in an email to you all that Travis had um, proposed um, keeping the increase in my hours across the next fiscal year. Financially, that works out to $1,700 um, added to the planning board budget that you voted on previously. And so the finance committee would just like you to affirm that you're okay with that approach. So what happens in fiscal 22, if approved by town meeting would be that you would essentially be paying for 32 of my hours and the zoning board would pay for the balance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna make a motion. Was that? Newly added, or was that moved from somewhere else, Karen? It was newly added. Okay. Okay, so you, uh, Josh has made a motion. Do I have a second? To approve. To approve that. <laughs> I will second, second that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, there you go. Okay, so Jason has second that. All right, all in favor, I guess starting with Karen. <laughs> Aye. All right, uh, Jason. Aye. Scott. Aye. And aye. Josh. Aye. And David. Aye. Okay. So that is takes care of that. I don't know if there was anything else in regards to that. No, that's all we have. Let's see. And uh, 705. I think we're past 705. I just want to make sure. Yep. 712. So I guess we'll start, we'll continue the public hearing for Gill Realty Trust, uh, 45 Washington Street. And um, I think we have uh, a few people on the call here from there. Mr. Chairman, Dan Marikin with Legacy Engineering here with the applicant, Richard Gill. All right, how are you? Good, how are you this evening? Thanks. So at the last meeting, we were basically ready to button things up. There were two things outstanding. One was a draft decision, which Karen has prepared. 
And the second was the addition of a dumpster pad to the site plan, which we did add in the location that I indicated to you at the last meeting, which is behind the building and off the right rear corner. So you have that plan in hand and you have uh, a draft decision. I'm happy to throw the plan up on the screen if you'd like me to. Uh, sure, that'd be great. Please, thank you. So we just added this dumpster pad here in the in the right rear corner. Otherwise, everything else is the same as we looked at last week. Okay. So that dumpster is uh, it's up on a concrete pad, I guess it looks like. It's in a fenced enclosure on a pad. The applicant expects that he's just going to have a couple of small roll offs in there, not a really you know large dumpster. They don't generate a lot of waste, so okay, um, that'll accommodate a couple of small roll offs. And the uh, Conservation Commission did, did issue their approval um, yesterday, the day before. So everybody's squared away, and you guys are the final stop on this. All right. Uh, I guess uh, we'll start with Scott. Scott, did you have any questions? Um, no, I feel like I was referring back to my notes. I feel like we were, we were in a pretty good spot with this one last meeting. So, yeah, I don't have any questions. Okay, all right. And Karen? Um, you know, I do kind of feel like Scott does. I think the only thing that I am a little more focused in on is condition number six and wondering if that language is clear enough to be understood by all. I mean, are we, are we only talking about asphalt reclamation or any services coming in and out of the industrial park to be using the main entrance at Washington and Whitney? Oh, I just wrote that from my notes, Karen. I'm, I, um, are you thinking there might be a paver coming out of the park as well? Uh, I, Plumbing, anything, just to make sure it uses um, the entrance that's right across the street. Okay. Right, there are various services that could be employed, and I just would like it to be clear that we're going to use the main entrance to uh, access the work coming to or leaving from. Okay. Perhaps you just change um, uh, local asphalt reclamation to construction activities. Or maintenance activities, just anything where you would be using services out of the park, you're right across the street. Uh, it would be, we would like to, I would like to advise that you're using the main entrance. And the main entrance being uh, Whitney Street? Yes, right across the street from you, Whitney. Whitney at Washington is the main entrance, yes. Is there anything else, Karen? No, I, I think that uh, Karen hit upon everything with, with good detail. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason. I have no issues uh, with it. Uh, we, as Scott said, we covered quite a bit last time, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Josh, I didn't know if there's anything. Okay. You were all set. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, list point, and I didn't know if there's anything else you had that you would, in regards to this. No, I, I okay. think I'm good. I, um, I think Dan has noted that the Hong Kong closed, and I think previously we had noted that the zoning board had issued their decision for work within the floodplain or determined that there is no impact to the floodplain. Okay. And I don't have any further questions. I think at this point, um, I didn't know if there was anybody. I, I'm going to read a quick statement here. I meant to read at the beginning of this. Uh, and this is for uh, the town will be asking those that want to speak, use the raise hand feature. If you are using a tablet or a smartphone and want to speak, touch the screen depending on your device, either on the bottom or the top of the screen. There are three dots. Next to participants. Press the three dots and then press raise hands. 
If you are using a laptop or desktop computer and want to speak, click on the participants at the bottom of the screen. This will open a participants window at the right. In the bottom right-hand corner, under the participants window, click on the raised hand. Number three, if you are dialing by phone, you can press nine to in indicate you want to speak. If you are calling by phone, when you announce uh, by the board, you will need to press star six to unmute the, the phone. If you are unable to find the raise hand feature, you can send a chat to the town of Holliston requesting to speak to the planning board and will be notified. Uh, I hope I was clear with that. I apologize if I read through that very quickly, but I just want to make that clear to anybody on this call. Um, and I guess at this point, I'll open this up to the public. If there's anybody that has um, any questions in regards to uh, 45 Washington Street, this is uh, for Gil Rayleigh Trust. This is on the Sherburne side, 16 uh, Washington Street. I just want to make sure I see. Uh, uh, I see one person here, uh, Rita Bell. Hi. Hello, Rita. Hi, how Hi. are you? How are you? Um, Rita Bell, 37 Locust Street. Um, let's see, here I am. Um, can you describe what this business is? Certainly. Want me, want me to take that as the applicant? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, we're a um, used car uh, facility, used car and service. Okay. You've, you've been there for a long time, or is this a new business? We've been there since uh, the, the, the business has been there since, I believe, the 1950s. I bought it in 1986 and have been operating under uh, Countryside Auto since 1993. So 27 years. Okay, so why have you come before the planning board? Uh, to, uh, we are erecting a new building there. We're going to do the same, um, operate the same business model that we're operating now, but with a new oh. Okay, just just checking, you're in the neighborhood. I just, uh, I actually tuned into this meeting for another reason, but uh, this popped up and I just, Kind of wanted to know what was going on there. Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and then I see uh, uh, John Barrell. So I don't have a particular question about this issue, but I had sent a message via private chat. Your motion to end the meeting at 930 is improper. There are three methods to end the meeting. The agenda is complete. A member makes a motion that is considered, and if approved, the meeting ends, or a riot breaks out. You cannot preset the end of a meeting. Okay. That's per Robert's rules of order. You can Google it, because I had to Google it to refresh my memory. Okay. Um... We have uh, uh, town council uh, attorney Tellerman on the on the call here. Uh, I just just thought I'd ask him just in regards to this. Uh, well, first of all, Robert's rules of order don't apply to your meetings, and second of all, you absolutely can can end it at nine thirty. Now, if you have a scheduled public hearing, you should at least open it um, if you have it scheduled for uh, for the night. But you have every right to set an end date, uh, an end time for any of your meetings. So what rules of order are we operating under? Just ba basic parliamentary procedure. There's no statute or local bylaw that requires they follow Roberts. If they did file and follow any um, parliamentary so procedure, it wouldn't be Roberts, though. It would probably be closer to town meeting time. But neither of them are applicable so under Massachusetts there, law to local public hearings. There are, there are two Stand, there's Robert's rules of order and standard rules apply. of order. They don't apply. Neither of them apply. So what, apply. What, what, what rules of order are we operating under? The, the, public, the open meeting law does not prescribe any specific 
rules of order. You have to make clear motions. You have to keep minutes. You have to take a record. Where is of, that defined? That's uh, the the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law. That's uh, this is this is not a debate that really needs to be had. The, okay. the board is well right. Okay. Well, either way, okay. I have no problem making a motion at nine thirty then. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, th thank you for your uh, concern. Uh, uh, and okay, at this point, uh, are there any anybody else that has anything in regards to uh, 45 Washington Street? Okay. Uh, I think at this point, uh, if we are, I think I don't see any other questions. If there's somebody that would like make to make a motion. a motion to this, okay. To Josh has made a motion to approve this. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Scott has seconded. Okay, all in favor, starting with Karen. Aye. Okay, uh, Jason. Aye. Okay, Scott. Aye. All right, Josh. Aye. Okay, and David, aye. Okay. Okay, and we need to close the public hearing. And make a motion to close the public hearing on 45 Washington. Okay, Josh has made a motion. Do I have a second? Second, Scott. Scott has seconded it. Okay, uh, uh, Karen. Aye. Okay, uh, Jason. Aye. Okay, Scott. Aye. Okay, uh, Josh. Okay, David, aye. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. We appreciate it greatly. Yes, uh, Chairman, members of the board, I do very much appreciate um, the way this has gone. And I feel like you guys have treated me really fair, and um, I look forward to a really nice project. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much Thank for your you. project. Congratulations Thank you. on your new building. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be CRG Integrated Real Estate Solutions 555 Hoppingbrook. Um, and I just, a couple words before we start. Um, there's several people that are going to be uh, presenting, and uh, during that period, board members will be able to ask questions at any time during that. When that's all done, the presentation, then we're going to open it up uh, for public comment. So, um, and again, I can read that whole description again if, if anybody has any questions in regards to how you raise your hand through the computer system to speak. Um, but uh, at this point, um, I would also ask uh, that everybody on this call, we're all, know, all on this, uh, to learn more information. And if people could really, uh, really be polite, um, again, uh, I understand there's some frustration. But at this point, we're, we're all here to just get some information. Um, and with that, I will start. I believe the first person that is presenting is uh, Frank. <clears throat> Oh, uh, I don't. Chairman, Frank, um, you need to unmute. <laughs> oh, he's got to unmute. Okay. Okay. Up. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Am I, am I audible now? You are. Yes. Okay. So, Peter, if you wouldn't mind putting up our presentation, offer some video. Can I share the screen, Mr. Chairman, at this point? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Is that coming up on the screen? No, nope, not yet. Nope. All right. Wait a minute. How about now? I see it now. I yeah, see I it. <laughs> Good. Hey, thank you. And Peter, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, as, as I talk, maybe make that as large as you possibly can while still visible and just sort of follow me along and we'll, we'll, we'll get through these fairly quickly. But, you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight, Mr. Chairman and, and all board members. Um, my name is Frank Pekunas and I, uh, I serve as the Northeast Regional Head for CRG. Um, I assume that most people already know that, that CRG is the company that will ultimately develop this property if everything goes okay. 
So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about uh, who we are, what we do, and maybe add some additional context to the project. Um, obviously, the, the current owner of the property has been the face of the project thus far, and, and that's mainly because of their vested interest in, in marshalling the process, but it's, it's also because of their, their long history with the site and the past knowledge that comes with that. Um, so they've been leading the charge, but I think we're at a point where I may be able to answer some of your questions better than that, and that's why I'm here. Um, now, I understand that the main topic for tonight's meeting might be traffic, so I want to allow a lot of time for that, but I want to you know, take a few minutes to introduce CRG, um, but more importantly, offer some design ideas uh, that may help mitigate some of the existing concerns. Um, so, Peter, starting on that first slide, that's great. Um, you know, CRG is a, it, we're a real estate investment company that builds four main categories. We build multifamily, we build commercial, we build institutional, meaning hospitals, schools, things of that nature, and we, we build industrial category. Um, you know, we're national in scope. We have headquarters in St. Louis and Chicago, um, but we implement projects on a regional basis with, with market offices in a number of major cities. Um, if you can advance that slide, Peter, um, the structure of the company is, is summarized on this slide. We have three main branches, um, those being CRG, LJC, and Clayco. Now, CRG is the entity that I work for. We basically handle the development of, of the projects. LJC is a big design firm that we own. We've got about 250 architects, engineers uh, on staff. And we also own Clayco Construction, um, who does all of our general contracting work. And what's good about this structure is that it allows us to control all aspects of the process. Um, it also allows us to negate you know, any complications that could otherwise arise if we use outside firms. Um, the next slide, Peter. Um, this kind of summarizes our historical metrics. We've been doing this for 27 years. Um, we have a long history of knowledge in these product categories. So, you know, the point here is to say we're well capable of, of capitalizing the project and completing the project and basically doing things um, in a very professional manner. It's what we do. Um, so, so with all of that said, Peter, if you can advance to the, to the next slide. Um, I, I know one of the main questions is who's going to be in the building? And, and the owner's response to that has been, we don't know yet because this is a speculative development. And that's true. Um, we do, however, know the types of businesses that traditionally lease our buildings. Um, and those businesses operate, as, as you'd expect, uh, reflective of these bulleted characteristics. And you've heard these before, you know, it's, it's storage and distribution uh, of consumer goods, 24-7 uh, operation, traffic per the projections in our studies, and an employee count of, and I'm going to stress this, a maximum of 500 employees. The reason why I say a maximum of 500 employees is because our SAS or septic system is designed on that. So, you know, we do have a couple of things within the design of this project that would, you know, would serve as maximums or ceilings to the type of numbers that we're talking about here. Um, more specifically, however, and Peter, if you can go to the next slide, um, you can see the type of tenants that might occupy the building. So it could be household goods, it could be clothing, it could be dry goods, electronics, beverages, and, and, and on the next two slides, um, and you can sort of toggle back between those if, if you want, Peter. Um, you know, here are some actual tenants in some of our buildings, again, consistent with the use. Now, I've been told that, that, that some parties may be equating our Cubes brand. If you look at some of these slides, it's called the Cubes at Troutdale or the Cubes at Emig Road. Um, I've been told that, that, that some people may be equating that Cubes brand with the term high cube as it's defined by the Institute of Traffic Engineers. And I guess, I guess it's an attempt to render our traffic study inaccurate or invalid, or at least that's what I, I think I understand. So on that particular topic, let me just sort of explain that the Cube's brand is really a result of a, a marketing consultant study that we did, oh, years ago, um, with the intention of coming up with a cool logo and a brand scheme. Um, it doesn't apply anything sinister, nor does it create a rationale for a connection or a nexus to the use of any particular ITE category. It's just a brain for marketing purposes. Um, and I guess they came up with that because our buildings are boxy 
Um, but in terms of maybe an analogy, I like to tell people that, you know, there's a company called Apple that doesn't sell fruit. And there's a company called Arm & Hammer that doesn't sell hardware. So, you know, our brand isn't necessarily indicative of what may be deemed um, a use that isn't wanted within the township. Um, on the next slide, Peter, um, so another type of concern that I, I did hear about um, is that I recall that somebody was concerned that the site design might be indicative of a certain use. So in order to make the discussion a little bit easier, I figured it would make some changes to the design itself. And maybe those designs would result in a project that's less impactful. Um, and I, I think also those design changes would address some of the concerns that may still be apparent. And those design changes are kind of noted here in bullet form. And Peter, I'm going to ask you in, in a moment to point these out on the plan. But here's what we're doing. I mean, instead of having 429 trailers, we felt it appropriate to knock off 150 of those. Just to show, to show everybody that when we design these things as a speculative building, we, we put components into them that we think tenants are going to like. If the amount of trailer spaces causes pause, then, you know, let's get rid of 150 of them. And that's what we did. Um, we also made the parking on both sides of the building a little bit more indicative of a warehouse use. We have 200 spaces on each side of the building. Um, we reduced our loading dock doors from 170 to 160, and that's really to maintain an industry standard of you know, one dock door per 5,000 feet, which is what we really need. Um, and Peter, if you can go back to that bullet <laughs> list so I can kind of follow. I'll, I'll ask you to go over this in a second. I mean, maybe this is a little bit inefficient. I think most importantly, however, we're putting a 30-foot berm on the south, east, and north limits of the property. Now imagine 30 feet of earth and berm. On top of that, we're going to put an eight-foot fence. And on the medway side of that eight-foot fence, we're going to do an evergreen screen of about 200 trees. So to accommodate that, however, we need to move the setback of the building. So we're going to increase the setback from 240 feet to 400 feet. So we've added 160 feet to the building setback. And again, Peter, I'm going to ask you to point these out visually when we're sort of done with these. Now, the next bullet item, the reduction in the size of the south entry drive, and the well, the next two, the relocation of the guard shack from the south to the west side, was really a result of a resident who called me. And, and so there have been a couple of residents that called me that really had some, some good ideas. And, and I think I talked to this gentleman for a fairly long time. I've been a half hour, 45 minutes. But he had basically told me that the optics of our previously submitted and approved plan had a four-lane uh, drive that sort of went up the southern side of the building, and there was a guard shack, which was kind of indicative of that mean, being the main entrance to the property. So what we've done is we'll reduce the width of that, that roadway so as to negate that and to also structurally put our trucks on the southern side of the building to make that the main entrance side, right? So the rest of these are basically reiterations of things that we've already agreed to per our um, per our previous site plan approval. Um, you know, we're doing bike paths, we're doing you know uh, road signalization along Hoppingbrook Road. So, Peter, why don't I ask you to sort of point to the plan, <laughs> blow it up to whatever extent you can, and maybe talk about some of these changes that we've already made. So, so the trailer parking, uh, for the most part, they were deleted through this zone and they were deleted through this zone um, that went from 429 to 278. Uh, we've got a parking lot on the uh, south side and the north side so that we can multi-tenant the building potentially. Um, we've got a reduction in loading docks. So there's basically 10 less docks uh, through this area on the site. We've got an earthen berm. So that berm starts in this zone here and it carries around the entire site. Keeps coming back along the, the west, um, east, come back here along the, the, the west, north, through here. And then we intend to carry that forward as we go forward and develop the adjacent site. 
On top of that berm is the fence, and on top of that berm is also the evergreen screen. Uh, the increase in setback uh, that's mentioned here is that's a setback from building to building. Uh, it was 240 originally, now it's 400. The uh, south drive is probably the most important feature here when you come off a of Hoppingbrook Road. The main traffic pattern is to come in and go to the left. The guard shack is located in this position. Originally, it had been on this side of the building. And basically, this right turn is a subordinated turn. So you go through the site basically in a clockwise fashion, come into the site, and then you would circulate around the buildings and depart. The, um, the other aspect of this is that we reduce the grades uh, within these zones. So we're not, um, we don't have a steep grade coming in or out of the site. Uh, again, Frank had alluded to the fact that the ADT study, um, we, we're going to talk about traffic specifically with uh, Vanessa. Uh, presenting that, so I don't need to speak about that any longer. Okay. Um, and then we have the South Street, uh, the restricted traffic provisions that we provided, and we were willing to fund any sort of mechanism the town wanted for uh, mitigating traffic on South Street. Okay, so, so Peter, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the, um, the section cuts um, yep. that basically show the newly proposed berm okay well the okay that's a superimposition of, of the last plan and the new plan you can explain right yeah so i could explain this briefly um so so basically in red shows what the original development scheme was and its position on the landscape and the blue uh shows where we've moved to uh, so the setbacks now are we were 50 feet from boundary to uh limit of work uh now we're um still at that 50 for limit of work but now it's an evergreen uh, screen and berm uh, were 175 to the uh, edge of pavement um, instead of the uh, previous 50. So we've increased that 125 feet. The building uh, was 230 from boundary and now it's 355 from boundary. Um, the sections, you can still see where the original homes were located and we have provided you with sections previously. So now we've contrasted those from what we had done originally and what we did, we're doing now. So the, the top one here, let me just try to zoom in a little bit more to that. Um, so this property specifically is the Reagan property, 15 carriage house way. The top view shows what it will look like under the current proposal and the lower shows what it previously was. So they're lining up at the same uh, juncture here for the building setback line, which is the limit of work that we've been observing. The boundary is still at the same position. The house is still at the same position. So originally we were coming to this position and starting with our uh, trailer parking area. And now that trailer parking area starts at this position here, 125 feet away. Um, and then the grade comes back to the building the house is located in this position. So you can see that the house has no visual to the building at all. Uh, the next section that we did was the uh, McEnany uh, residence at 12 carriage house way, uh, same pattern. Uh, again, the lower profile is what was there originally in our original plan. So house to building, the limit of work to the building located here. And again, that same area lines up top of berm comes back to the trailer parking in that zone and the building. And you can see again, if you line up to the house, to the building, there's no visual uh, at all. So, so Peter, how, um, how tall is that berm at that particular point at that section? It's 30 foot. Okay. Then, there's, then the fence goes on top of that. Okay, so, and, and as far as vegetative stabilization on the other side, right? I mean, that vegetative stabilization. Yes. And I, and I do know that someone's gonna ask the question, well, who's going to maintain all of this? And the answer is, we are. All right, it's on our property. We will maintain everything. <laughs> right. I mean, we expect it to, to be, you know, a, a naturally vegetated area, and I would expect it just to naturalize. Yep. Um, we did the comparisons. We just we kept down, uh, going down. So just give another example. So the one here is um, Galuli at one old uh, Surrey Lane. Again, the relationships are the same. Here's that building, so it's set back a bit more from where the boundary is. But again, it, from its vantage point uh, through um, the uh, previous uh, section and then where it is today. Again, it will have no visual to the building whatsoever. 
And the uh, last one we did was Sheehan at uh, 5 Old Surrey Lane. And again, this is what the previous view was, and this is what the current view is. Again, the house being located at lower position. Um, again, you will have no visual back to the building. Okay. So, so moving right along, and I, I, I think we can sort of pause after the next. Well, it, you, you should outline I'll, these things. Well, I would before we do that. I'd like to sort of pause here and ask any of the board members if they have any questions or if you'd like us to elaborate on anything. Because the next two slides will be traffic study results and, and noise study results. Okay. Uh, starting with uh, Josh, do you have any questions? You're <clears throat> um, saying you've moved down from 429 trailers to 200 and is it 78 or 28? What was it? It's 278, Josh. Excellent. And are you still running the same amount of trucks with the smaller amount of trailer space? And, you know, or, or is that just going to prolong like into nighttime trucking? I, the traffic, the traffic trips didn't change because, you know, deleting trailer spaces doesn't contribute to anything that ITE predicts. So, so the short answer is we're still at about 1,380 T's and that's a combination of truck and trailer, I'm sorry, truck and cars. Um, the truck count was what, Peter, 300 plus and the remainder was cars? I, I believe that's what it was in the study. I guess Scott will be able to give us specifics okay. on that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Scott. Um, yeah, I guess what's the um, what's the plan for the interior of the building? Are you going to um, basically just be like turning over a shell of a building to whoever leases it, or and then they build it out to their specifications, or are you going to be constructing anything on the inside? That's a that's a great question. We we like to maintain again. We like to maintain control because as we own this particular building, we don't want it to be mistreated or misused or anything of that nature. So what we do one hundred percent of the time is when a tenant approaches us and says, hey, we'd like to lease your building. Um, we talk about what they want to do in the building. That's number one. And number two, we, we basically negotiate a level of what we call tenant improvements. And usually what we do is we, as a landlord, we build for them what they want. And that includes you know, office space at a particular corner of the building, whether it's 3,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet. Part of it is um, a janitor's closet. Um, um, a, a maintenance worker's lounge, you know, things of that nature. What we do stop short of is what we call proprietary type of equipment, and that would be their racking that they would use internal to the building and any of their equipment that they would bring in, such as forklifts. So basically, we would do the build out inside of the building. They would do their own racking. What about like processing equipment, conveyors and anything like that? Is that you or is that the tenant? No, we wouldn't do that because it's so proprietary. They they would usually do that. But I've only done that with one tenant in my entire 30-year career. And uh, that particular tenant has already been mentioned in past meetings. So <laughs> yeah, I don't see anybody really having a heavy automated requirement in this building, to tell you the truth. Okay. Y'all, is that it, Scott, or did you? Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, for right now, I think I probably have a couple more questions when we okay. start to really dig into the traffic study. But yeah, I'm good for now. Okay, great, uh, Karen. I'm good. I'm just listening and taking notes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, and uh, Jason. Same, same here, David. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think at this point, and I'm listening too, I'm trying to take this in uh, if we wanted to continue on, I think uh, in terms of questions. I'm good. Okay. Okay, well, let's, well, let's do so. So on, on this next slide, um, this is basically the traffic study results and all things related to it. And I, I really wanna let the pros talk here, but um, as you know, we commissioned a, a follow-up traffic study that predicts about 1,300 ADTs. Um, we also paid for a peer review um, that was done by MDM. And I, I think we have Bob on the line, do we, Peter? Uh, yes, Bob should be here this evening. Okay. 
if, if we can release him or, or open up his access to the call, I think he might want to chime in. Um, so, but what I'd like to say is as a result of these studies um, and scrutiny by MassDOT and our Section 61 finding, you know, we agreed to do a number of things that are, are bulleted here, right? It's the South Street restrictions, it's the improvements at the main intersection, it's the beacon flashers. And, you know, the message here is to say, look, you, you know, tell us, tell us what you'd like and we're open to ideas. Um, and this thus far has been what we've agreed to do. Um, I guess I'll hand it over to you, Peter, to maybe add a little bit more detail or, or, or maybe introduce Bob and, and his finding. Yeah, I, I, we're going to have Scott make a full presentation and I have his uh, agenda next. Uh, I was just going to close with basically our last slide because you know, it was an overview, Frank. Um, okay. That was Good the time. noise study and the site plan modification. So you, you know, I'd let you finish presenting and um, then okay, I'll great. great. Okay, so just, just touching on the noise study, you know, a, a study has been completed, you know, showing that we're, we're compliant with both local and state regs. Um, but I think it's important to note here that the design changes that we had, we had suggested are the reason why we're allowed to accomplish this, right? So um, as, as we sort of looked at this project and, and looked at the impacts and looked at things that we could do to make it better, we thought, okay, we're going to be spending a heck of a lot more money and we're moving the building, we're making some big changes here, but the net result is a better project, right? And full compliance with both, both local and state regs with respect to the noise. And there's a lot more detail available on that particular topic, but again, I'm going to let the pros address that stuff better than I. Do you have anything to add on any of that stuff, Peter? I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to start traffic if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. I know Scott Thornton. I saw him in the pictures a bit ago, so I'm sure he's ready. Sure. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm going to still share my screen, and I'm going to just going to bring up the the, the Vaness, uh study. Okay. Uh, Scott, um, hopefully that is visually correct, and you can see that yep. well. Yep, that looks good. That looks good. Great. Uh, Thanks, Peter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, for the record, my name is Scott Thornton. I'm with Vanessa Associates, and we prepared the traffic assessments on behalf of the applicant. And I have a few slides here, a number of charts that hopefully will synthesize uh, some of the issues that uh, have been discussed and uh, hopefully clarify things related to traffic. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the assessment itself, um, Peter, are you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Something just happened on my screen, so I apologize. So I hang in there, my friend. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea what just happened. It was the wrong. It was the control function. Goodness. Hey, Peter, is it down at the bottom, the left, where it says five 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 hop? Is it that? Nope. No. No, I lost my exhibit. <laughs> Deal with me a moment, Scott. You can keep talking. I'll get it. I'll just keep talking. That's fine. So, um, so I, I want to point out that that this was a conservative traffic assessment. You know, we started with 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 a with a set of assumptions that were appropriate for the use. Uh, we then increased those. There we go. We then increased those those estimates of traffic, and then increased them again, and then increased them again really all to test the, the Washington Street, Hovingbrook Road intersection. And these increases more than double the traffic generation of the, the two parcels, both the 800,000 square foot warehouse parcel and the remaining 700,000 square foot parcel uh, from, from the initial memo that was prepared in, uh, in January of 2020. Um, as far as the chronology goes, uh, the Last year, obviously, there was the, the initial memo from January of 2020 um, that looked at the uh, traffic for warehouse use. Uh, November 2020 memo, that was the first study that Vanessa and Associates prepared. Uh, estimated traffic from the ITE warehouse land use code data. 
this this memo was reviewed by both Mass DOT and the the town's peer consultant MDM and Bob Michaud. And then the then there was a, a follow up study that was issued by uh, issued for uh, in January last month. Uh, that was prompted by comments from MDM that were related to the uh, initial traffic assessment in, in November of 2020. Um, speaking of that, that November 2020 assessment, as Frank indicated, um, this it has been approved by MassDOT. They issued a Section 61 finding uh, that identified mitigation and also the need for, for future study through a notice of project change that will analyze the impact of the of the remaining phases of the project. Um, there was an initial design, initial conceptual improvement design that was prepared um, and included in that November 2020 memo for the intersection of Hoppingbrook Road with Washington Street. And DOT agreed with that design and the signal warrant analysis, which which indicated the the intersection and the traffic volumes uh, would meet uh, warrants for traffic signalization. So, moving on to the to the town's review and MDM's review, um, MDM had requested a uh, sensitivity analysis uh, where we looked at um, sort of a a stress test of the intersection based on yet another way to analyze or another couple ways to analyze and estimate the traffic uh, for the project. Uh, it results in an even more conservative approach than what we previously identified. Uh, we recently received uh, comments from, from Bob Michaud indicated his agreement with the, with the results of the January 2021 memo. Um, I think a, a, a Few charts follow that that hopefully will clarify things. So I'm going to go to the next slide. This shows uh, in a graphical format the trip projections that we were starting off with in the January 2020 memo. Uh, the estimate for warehouse traffic for the morning and the evening peak hours was was uh, about 104 trips in the morning. That's total both directions entering and exiting, and 72 trips in the evening peak hour. So when we analyze the project, we use the, the straight ITE land use code 150 for warehouse. Um, and that resulted in an increase in trips over what was previously identified, about 32 additional trips in the morning and uh, about uh, 80 trips additional in the evening. And the peak hour basis is relevant because this is how the intersection is designed and analyzed. So, so at, at, at this point, I think it's, you know, it's, it's also important to realize where, where we're coming from with the project. So the next slide provides a comparison of what we've, what we've looked at. Now, the, the, the four columns represent the di different development scenarios. And these were analyzed in the in the November 2020 memo, and we have uh, scenario A in column A. This this and these are phrased in terms of daily uh, traffic generation. So, the for scenario A that represents the existing traffic that's generated by the park and what's currently under construction and expected to. Uh, be occupied shortly. So that gives us a, a total of 3,456 daily trips. When we add, when we go to column B and we add the traffic from the proposed warehouse, that's the additional 1,310 trips that was, that was, that, that Frank alluded to. That gets us up to 4,766 daily trips. If we then look at the, the remaining build out of the 700,000 square foot warehouse, that adds another 1,152 trips, which gets us to 5,918 daily trips expected for the full build out of the park. That represents the existing and the future development of the park. It, the trip generation would effectively 
be capped at, at 5,918 daily trips. Then in column D, we provided what the initial MEPA trip estimates were from 1982. So those which contemplated a, a mix of office and lab and research and development space, which generate trips at a much more intense rate are represented about 12,000 additional trips over what is expected to occur on the site with the current level and planned development levels. So, you know, the, the office, there were some office buildings that were developed and occupied. Those generate and, and intensify, have a, have a higher intensity trip generation rate than where the park is currently headed with its mix of industrial and warehouse space. And the, the current tenants, the, or the current office uh, uh, buildings that are on site have an effect in, in increasing the traffic generation of the site. So for instance, if, if it was all warehouse and all industrial, we would have a much lower existing number than what we do. But because, because there are some office tenants on site, then uh, that effectively raises the traffic generation that's, that's currently occurring out on the site. And I think this, this leads to, to a point that, um, that uh, MDM had raised. Um, if we could go to the, to the next slide. So, so NDM noticed that the, that the current park trip generation approximates the, the traffic generation rates of a different land use code, of land use code 130, which is uh, an industrial park. And therefore they requested the use of those trip generation statistics in, the, in one sensitivity analysis. So we, we, we performed that test assuming first that the, that the phase two uh, remaining portion of the, of the site to be built out was analyzed as an industrial park. And using the industrial park instead of the warehouse to account for the, for the remaining build out of the park resulted in between 161 and 147 additional peak hour trips depending on the morning or the evening time period. And again, this is this is not what's this is not what was proposed or what's what's currently proposed. This is just another way of uh, pro providing a sort of a sense of comfort or a factor of safety in the traffic analysis to identify that the you know what 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 could happen if the site um, if the overall if the if the seven hundred thousand square foot remaining parcel generated traffic at a at a higher rate. Than, um, than what is proposed with the warehouse. So that's sensitivity analysis number one. The next slide shows the, sen the sensitivity analysis number two, in which case we were requested to use the higher trip generation rate of, of industrial park for the remaining portion of the, of the build out of the park, in including the 800,000 square foot warehouse parcel that's that's the subject of the of the current discussion. So so now we're looking at um, at at the remaining build out of the site being developed at this much higher intensity trip generation rate of of industrial park. And this results in an increase of between 315 and 345 additional peak hour trips during the, depending on the morning or the evening time period. And again, just to reiterate, these are hypothetical conditions really meant to, to provide a basis for, for, uh, for adding additional traffic and trip generation into the intersection design for Hopping Brook Road with Washington Street. It's not that it's proposed that these are additional trips uh, that resulting from any any development that's proposed by the applicant. This is just a way of, of, uh, of providing a stress test of the intersection design with 
you know, assuming, you know, rather than just, just, you know, adding 50% more traffic or 75% more traffic. This is a, this provides an additional uh, sort of legitimate way of estimating an additional traffic demand at the intersection. So the next slide provides a, a sort of a summary of, oh, that table came out very, very small. Peter, can you zoom in on that at all? Um, so this, this is the, this is the, uh, the conceptual improvement plan that um, for the intersection improvements that we identified for Hoppy Brook Road and Washington Street, we're proposing uh, traffic signalization. As I mentioned, the intersection will meet the uh, traffic signal warrants um, as identified in, uh, in industry standards and, and mass DOT requirements. Uh, we're proposing separate left and right turn lanes on Hopping Brook Lane and uh, a separate left turn lane into the site uh, headed westbound. And, um, the, and then we would have uh, uh, separate lanes for, uh, to maintain the, the through and uh, through traffic in the eastbound and westbound directions. But, but the, the analysis that we did, the overall intersection analysis that we performed indicated, you know, under the, under the first, so the first column indicates the uh, level of service and the operations you, with just the 800,000 square foot where foot, uh, warehouse parcel, excuse me, for, for, the, for the weekday morning and the weekday evening peak hours. And that came in at level of service B and level of service C respectively. So overall intersection delays of, of under uh, 35 seconds. The next column over, the second column, indicates the, uh, the results of the, of, the, of the total build out of the site as warehouse, which is what's contemplated. So that's a total of 1.5 million square feet as warehouse development. Again, we're still at level of service B and level of service C. The third column indicates the build out with 800,000 square feet of warehouse space and 700,000 square feet of the industrial park. Now we're at level of service C for both time periods, which is still adequate operations for peak hour conditions. And then finally, the, the last column represents sort of the, the, you know, the worst of the worst case scenarios, uh, which is a 1.5 million square feet of industrial park development, much higher traffic generation, uh, over double the, the traffic that was initially contemplated uh, for, the, for the site and or for, the, for, this, for these two remaining parcels. And we're still coming in at level of service D operations for the morning and the evening peak hour. So, so these are, again, these are, these are the analyses that have been provided and documented. Uh, all backup has been provided to MassDOT and to, to, uh, to MDM for their review. Um, if uh, we could go to the next slide, Peter, it's really the, the conclusion slide. So, just to, just to reiterate, the traffic analysis and the warehouse program has been approved by, by MassDOT. Any changes to, to that program would require revisiting of the MEPA and the MassDOT approvals. And in addition, there's, there's, a, there's, still, uh, meet, there's still MEPA uh, analysis that has to be prepared uh, for the phase two that's consistent with the section 61 finding. Uh, traffic signal warrants are met for the future condition. And as Frank indicated, the applicant will build this improvement. Um, sensitivity analyses requested by uh, MDM indicate that assuming more intensive uses results in additional traffic. However, Hopping Brook at Washington Street intersection operates at level of service D or better. And also, as indicated by section by, by mass dot or is likely to be indicated by mass dot and also by mdm uh, we expect to conduct monitoring of the of hopping brook road of both this site and the park in general and provide those results to the town and mass dot 
And that just further validates the uh, expectations that we have for the, for the traffic generation and the operation of the intersection. So that's what I have for traffic. Um, I don't know who it goes back to, if it goes back to Peter or maybe to, to Bob for, um, for his input, but that's it from the project side. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it would be best if Bob would just weigh in at this point, and I, I don't have to continue to share the screen. If Bob wishes to um, put something up, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing. And, um, okay. and then I'll just ask if Bob could speak. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, uh, through the chair, my name is Robert Michaud, Managing Principal of MDM Transportation Consultants. Uh, we've been retained for some time, actually, uh, by the town to conduct peer review for this particular site. Uh, our first review was actually documented in a letter of February 19th of 2020. And subsequently, uh, based on the more current version of the site plan uh, in December of 2020, December 23rd, um, what we've done since uh, that second review, December 23rd review, is to have a consultation process that entailed um, input uh, from the town as well as the um, proponent, the applicant, and their engineer that relates to um, ways in which um, uh, the applicant can demonstrate its ability to have a functional site under various assum assumed operating conditions, right? The, the so-called sensitivity analysis. Um, and that's exactly what uh, Scott has just presented to the board and to the public. Um, our view, and this was do documented in our December 23rd, uh, 2020 memo, was that the existing park characteristic is nearly identical uh, to an industrial park land use category as it's defined with, uh, within the trip generation manual uh, published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, ITE. And it, it seemed prudent to us uh, to assume that that pattern of traffic, uh, that characteristic of traffic as an industrial park be expanded uh, into the so-called build out uh, scenario for the, for the, uh, uh, for the park. Uh, not only for the 700,000 square feet of uh, phase two development, but uh, as well for the uh, 800,000 square foot proposed building. Now, I will say, and we've documented in a letter that we've submitted to the board today uh, that is now part of, part of uh, public record, that our position uh, is that the applicant has satisfactorily demonstrated that the characteristics of the 800,000 square foot building are in fact consistent with uh, an industry standard uh, for a warehousing use. And the way that we arrive at that conclusion is twofold. One is there's um, a defined level of employment and shift patterns that are associated with the use that are consistent with the lower employment level uh, warehouse type facilities. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, that the proposed parking modifications, which reduce the parking supply to 400 total spaces, are also consistent with uh, ITE's projection and characteristics for warehousing type uses. Uh, and in fact, uh, within uh, the document called Parking Generation, which is another ITE publication, the warehousing land use category at 800,000 square feet would have projected peak parking demands that range from 318 parking spaces to 376. So it's very well aligned with what the applicant is currently showing on their revised site plan. Um, uh, and uh, so our conclusion here is that because of the way that the site is being designed, uh, because of the way the, um, the employment levels are being specified as, as being maximum at 500, because of the shift patterns that are being proposed, uh, all of those characteristics point to this being appropriately characterized as a warehouse type use. Um, as importantly, I will point out, and Scott touched on this, that um, the applicant has made a submittal to MassDOT uh, to secure approvals for a warehouse land use category uh, within the park. And um, 
it will be, meaning the applicant will be obligated uh, through what's known as the access permit process um, to uh, design and ultimately build improvements at the front door that accommodate that operating assumption, right? So in the, in the state's review of this, in MassDOT's review of this, there's a specific assumption and provision for a land use category called warehouse. And to the extent that category is materially different than what is being represented to the state, to MassDOT or through the MEPA uh, process, the state uh, or more particularly MassDOT would have every right to go back to the applicant uh, to request and uh, require, in fact, uh, a modification of the permit for that use. Uh, so there is there is a safety backstop to this uh, that, that, that does exist. Um, I will say through our, my own personal experience on working on many industrial sites in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including Amazon sortation facilities, distribution facilities, uh, Home Depot, uh, uh, warehouse and distribution facilities and others, that what is being proposed here is entirely consistent with a warehouse type use. So um, our, our view is that that is properly referenced as a warehouse use. That said, we did request the sensitivity analysis to stress test what is being proposed for improvement at Washington Street. Uh, and that is the, the sensitivity analysis that Scott presented. Um, and uh, for the two types of sensitivity analysis that were presented in both cases demonstrate that the infrastructure, the signal, the lane um, assignments at Washington Street will appropriately accommodate even those higher levels of traffic that would uh, theoretically occur under a, a different land use category scenario, i.e. industrial park. Um, I think the more realistic of those two um, sensitivity analysis uh, analyses were the assumption that the 700,000 square feet would be built out uh, and would generate traffic that is consistent with industrial park and that the 800,000 square foot building would function as a warehouse facility. That combination is the third of the fourth four columns that Scott presented and showed that, that on a um, letter grade basis, the intersection would work at a level of service C operation, which is quite efficient actually. Um, the state looks for operating standards of at least level of service D. And, um, and so we're comfortable that the stress test uh, was passed, uh, that, that all makes sense to us. Um, finally, we, uh, we acknowledge the applicant's commitment to monitor uh, we think it's appropriate to do that. In fact, uh, we believe that the state through uh, the section 61 finding process will obligate that for the park. And that provides the opportunity to measure and check the actual performance of not only the park generally, but the site specifically to ensure that um, its uh, assumptions uh, are correct uh, over an extended period of time. Uh, so with that, we, we conclude that what's being presented here uh, appropriately addresses the traffic impact of the project. Um, and uh, I'm glad to answer any specific questions that the board might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess in regards to, uh, thank you both for presenting. Um, if we could talk a little bit more, I think there's a lot of people on this call that uh, probably have some questions in regards to truck traffic going left out of the development and going down towards Milford or going down South Street. And then also the truck traffic that's gonna be going through the center of town or coming through. Um, I, and I, I just wanna address some of that because I know that's some concerns. Um, and I know we've talked about that before, but if somebody, I'm not sure who would like to talk about a few of these things in regards to truck traffic in di different areas. Okay, they're taking a right out and going through town or coming in through town or taking a left and then possibly going down South Street or towards Milford. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, Scott. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to address that question, Mr. Chair. So I, I believe there was a, just to circle back, there was a question about um, uh, total number of truck trips with the, with the warehouse and, and uh, Peter was right that it is, it is about 362 uh, trips on a daily basis uh, that would be 
that we're anticipating to be made by trucks. Uh, there is a, uh, the, the applicant has agreed to a, uh, to direct all trucks to uh, come to the site uh, from Washington Street, go and, and from 495. So traffic would, all truck tra traffic will be required to turn left out of Hoppingbrook Road to Washington Street, and it will all be required to come in from the west on Washington Street and turn right into the site. Uh, that is that is something that they have uh, agreed to implement with the, the trucks that are expected to visit the site. Okay. All right, um, Jason. I didn't know if you had any questions. I don't. Oh. Um, not, I mean, nothing. Nothing more than probably what we're all sort of thinking about, and that is enforcement uh, of of where these trucks turn. Um, so, you know, I, I hear what um, I forget his name. The gentleman just mentioned that uh, you know they'll be instructing the, the trucks to turn and and come straight from 495. Um, the question is of, of enforcement. I see it, uh, uh, Town Council Attorney Tellerman had, uh, he wanted to speak. Yeah. I, I didn't know which, uh, Jason, you were talking oh, about. I'm sorry. happy to defer to the the other board members. I, I ha might have oh, some okay. comments or questions, but uh, the might want to ask the other board members first. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Karen. I, I think that Jason, stated that really well. Um, I, I, my too is the question of, you know, how, what is the enforcement? How do you make sure that this actually happens? And, and I would just really for, for right now, I would retire with that question. Okay. Uh, well, I guess that'll be a question. I don't know if somebody would like to answer that now. I mean, I, I, I probably could. I could suggest something. I mean, at the, uh, okay. I, I guess the board, the board could impose a condition, and, and, and Jay Tellerman, you could you could comment on this. Um, you could impose a condition that, that requires us to pay for and install appropriate signage, uh, pay for and install appropriate physical barriers. Um, I mean, there could be a combination of other things. I mean, in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, um, we do... On, on a regular basis, um, limits are imposed upon our developments with respect to the volume. But as far as the direction of traffic, it's usually incumbent upon us to pay for and install signage that they identify for us. Okay. So this this can be, a, uh, Mr. Chairman, this can be a tricky area, and we've had some um, for the benefit of the public hearing, we've had some productive conversations, uh, myself and Karen, uh, Frank, Scott, uh, Bob, um, just ta talking through some of these issues, not trying to resolve them, but just kind of getting a lay of the land. And uh, Frank's been great, as has Scott and, and obviously Bob, um, to help, help us understand a little bit where they're coming from and where they're going. Enforcement's really hard in this context. It's like enforcing a noise bylaw where you just say, don't do it again, and you have to keep going after people. It's not that it's impossible, but we'd have to figure out a way to work with the applicant to have a number of enforcement mechanisms. Just having an endless series of don't do it agains can, um, can be problematic if there's some violations, obviously. And I've done a few of these before. There's a providing notifications to every single truck um, that is going in and having some advance notice, uh, setting up a fine structure, doing some other things like that to get enforcement. And it's not just with respect to the routes. As you can see, the applicant has been very clear about what they want to do. And I think that uh, um, I thank Frank for laying it all out there for us. Bob's helped um, cover it a little bit. Some of their design changes do create some limiting um, factors. So 
but some of the the elephant in the room has been from the beginning um, that this could be the next Amazon or a fulfillment center. I think Scott and Frank uh, and Bob too have have talked about how this design isn't quite square with that. How, however, we've also talked about having conditions and future monitoring to ensure that it doesn't spill into a use that is more akin to the kind of fulfillment center, high cube warehouse. Um, Scott has, he didn't present it tonight, but he's presented us with some numbers that show that that's a lot more traffic if that did happen. So at least we have a benchmark by which to measure whether or not the use changes. Um, there's some other issues regarding um, the state and giving certificates, but on a, on a local level, we'd have to really work with this applicant to establish all kinds of protocols for monitoring and enforcement. You know, the ultimate enforcement is stopping the use until it's corrected in some way, shape or form. But in the interim, there are some um, kind of other enforcement mechanisms. I'd be naive if I said that we'd expect 100% compliance from the, the trucking community accessing the site. It just doesn't. It just doesn't happen. I've done these kinds of facilities with these kinds of limitations before. However, with a good set of protocol um, in the projects I've worked on, and, uh, and I'm sure Bob can also underscore this as can Scott. We can really cut down um, and limit the amount of transgressions. It's difficult, no question about it, um, and we don't have the manpower in town to devote people to those um, to those roadways to sit and stake out intersections. So um, there's a lot of honor system here. So it's it's something that if the board otherwise finds the the project acceptable on other grounds, it's going to take a lot of work uh, for Karen, myself, the board, Frank, Scott, Peter, everyone's going to have to chip in and get something would get something that could uh, put, put the board's mind at ease. I think we're a ways away from that. But um, I just wanted to be be clear that, you know, again, it, it's not perfect, but we would do our darndest if the board otherwise found the uh, project approvable. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add at this point. Okay. Okay. Um, I didn't know if there was any other board members that had any questions. And I yeah, there was any David, if I could, if I could just jump in for quick, um, yeah. maybe someone said it during the, the presentation. If I missed it, I apologize, but I'd be interested to just understand what's the incremental traffic from this proposed site. Like, do we know what the traffic in and out of the industrial park is today? Just so I can kind of right size in my head what that 1300 additional vehicle trips really means. Yeah, we, we should have that available. Yeah, we have that. So, so it gener the site generates now about uh, 3,000, the, the park generates a little over 3,000, uh, 3,200 or so daily trips in, there's a current, there's two projects that are currently under construction uh, that are expected to add another four or 500 trips. So you'll get to about 3,500 daily trips and then the, the proposed warehouse would add another 1,300 trips to that. Okay, and how about um, if we're saying that most of the, or all of the truck traffic would be taking a left and heading towards 495, I guess, was there any thought put into sort of the route down the line? I guess I'm thinking in my head, if you're driving that way, you, you kind of go down into Milford and then you have to take a left at that intersection, sort of where the Hickey's liquor store is on the corner there, and that can be a tough intersection. I mean, that's not a very well laid out intersection to turn left to go down past off and shop to 495. I guess was any thought put into what that situation is going to look like? Uh, you know, we 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 saw that the the route is that there's a couple ways to go, either to you know either to 85 to the to the north 85 interchange or the 109 interchange to the south. So, so it's possible to make those maneuvers to, to either make the right turn onto Fortune Boulevard to head up to Route 85 or to, or to make the left turn onto Beaver to head south. Um, but, you know, again, we're, we're, 
we're anticipating that um, in the in the next stage, the uh, the MEPA analysis or the NPC analysis, that that a, a full review of the of um, of intersections going out to uh, an access pass going out to 495 uh, is going to be required. So that it'll be analyzed at that point for the for the next phase. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, Karen, Can I? It looks like. You yeah. Um, so, help me if my math is wrong, gentlemen. Um, so, it, from what Scott just asked, right, the incremental traffic daily. Currently at the park, it's roughly 3,200. There's going to be a buildup that's going to get to the 3,456, which is what you have as the existing in your table. Yep. And then you're proposing that the ultimate build out with 555 will be an additional 1,300 trips. So that's about 20% more traffic. Is that right? I mean, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to see, right? If, if, if we break things up into increments of 1,300, essentially, there's two and a third <laughs> plus another. It's like it's almost like another 20% of traffic. I just think sometimes percentages speak more to people than raw numbers. Am I am I wrong on that number? Help me out. No, no. Higher, Karen. No, it's. Uh, help, me help me out, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're on the right track. I mean, we're, you know, it's, it, we expect it to be, uh, 3,500, um, with those other two parcels that get, that are, that are under construction once they get occupied. And then, yeah, we add, a um, uh, you know, a little, a little less than, than, uh, half of that, uh, again, to get to the, to the next phase to 4766, but, you know, over, over, a over a daily basis, those trips are spread out. You know, the, the, the peak hour basis um, is, you know, the numbers are, are those, those are the numbers that, that people see. Those are the numbers that you notice when you're driving, because those are the, you know, the, the, the commuter, commuter uh, time periods. Um, and, you know, there's still, I mean, there's still increases, but um, in, in terms of, in terms of traffic increases, um, you know, it's it's about a vehicle every or two vehicles every minute entering or exiting during the during the peak time periods. So, um, so it's 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 sort of muted in in some degree because they're not all coming at once. They're not they're not. It's you know when you when, when you see a number of you know 4700 or something daily trips it, it, it's a huge number but spread out over over a day you know it's not likely to be noticed um and even during the peak hours if you have you know two cars entering and, and one car exiting or or a, a truck exiting um and two trucks entering it's over 60 minutes you know that happens every every minute during the peak hours it's it's less of an effect and uh, not likely to be noticed as you get further away from the site. Absolutely, at the intersection, you you would you would notice that. But again, the operation with the traffic signal is going to help to improve the traffic operations out there. Yeah, uh, Scott. I mean, I, I I guess I'll just wonder out loud on that and think to myself, well, I I think it depends on whose perspective we're talking about. Um, I mean. A change of vehicles every minute in the town. I think some people actually would notice that. Um, I was. I'm wondering though, as we focus on the intersection, which of course is important. However, the cars don't evaporate at the intersection; they keep going. And I'm wondering. Um, if we, we looked at like this impact of when cars do go right and when cars do go left, you know, um, it, it's still a lot of vehicle trips a day for a town that is the size of ours without being direct to an infrastructure of a major highway. There's something else I haven't heard mentioned and, and 
Um, I'm wondering why we're not talking about that. Maybe this is the wrong place to mention that. But is there any public transportation going into the park for people who would want to be able to access jobs without using their own vehicle? I haven't heard anything about that. Well, Scott, I mean, wasn't there an obligation, and Peter, help me out with this, and you're on mute. Um, isn't there an obligation or a condition for us to adhere to something akin to bicycles, paths, public transport, bus stops? Is there is there a condition imposed upon us to sort of do a study like that, or at least honor something like that? Or am I remembering a different project? No, no, you're you're, you're spot on. Um, so there was, there was um, we were encouraging um, by putting in bike racks. We did have that. Uh, on the site, uh, there is a bike path that goes through the park. Uh, and also um, there was a bus route we were supposed to explore. I wanna say it's number four, but Bob Michaud would know better because he knows the stuff he does the town review. But I, there is a bus that goes to Holliston. It does not go to the park. So we agreed to uh, explore uh, the use of that and try to uh, expand that route to our site. So that, that was also part of our uh, commitment uh, back in uh, March. So we would continue to honor that commitment. Yep. And I think that was imposed on the site plan, correct? The site That's plan. right. Okay. Yeah, and, and and just to just to follow up on that, I know that in the um, in the in the section sixty one finding, um, Mass DOT is requiring the uh, the designation of a on site transportation coordinator that's supposed to assist uh, in setting up uh, ride share programs for employees that want a car share or, or want a carpool or van pool uh, and identify any other any other types of alternative transportation resources that might be in uh, in the site or in and around the site. Okay. So at this point, uh, I just wanted to know if there's any other board members that have questions. I'd, we're at 8.30 or after 8.30. I'd also like to, I see there's a lot of hands that are raised from the public. Unless uh, there's another board member that has another question or if um, anybody Mr. else would like to quickly present. Is there somebody that... Um, Mr. Chairman, if um, can I ask um, to let Richard Nyland, Chip Nyland, uh, or take him off a of mute in the event that we do need him to answer some questions? Certainly. Is there something he would like to say before I open it up to the public? Is there something no. that... Uh... I don't think so, other than hi. But, uh, you know, in the event that, you know, something comes up, I mean, Jay may have a question directly for Chip. I, I just don't know. But he's listed as Richard, Richard Nyland on this. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> We want to make sure that people are asking the questions. And, and, and Chip, once they release you, you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. So just in case, there you go. All set. Thank and you. I'd like to just <laughs> under, want people to understand that they're, they should be asking the questions through the board and not directly to the applicant. Um, so uh, at this point, unless there's any other board members or anybody else that has any questions before I open it up to the public. We will now address everybody. Okay, and uh, again, if you could state your name and your address, uh, that would be great. Um, and I'm gonna start from the top. The first person that raised their hand is uh, John Varrell. Hi, Hi John. John. John Varrell, 928 Washington Street. Going back to the berm discussion, you talked a lot about line of sight of the building. What is being done to mitigate light pollution for a seven by 24 hour operation? And uh, dark, dark sky compliant. And, and Peter, if you can take yourself off of mute and talk about that condition, I think that was imposed upon us. So it will be dark sky compliant. And, and you know, again, lay person's terms, we're using light fixtures that really are designed to mitigate that. Right, Peter? Yeah, it's, 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 it's fully dark sky, sky compliant. Uh, there is a lighting analysis that was submitted as part of the original plan that was done and, and that we're revising that uh, and it will also uh, comply. So it was fully compliant the first time through and it will be fully compliant uh, the second time through. And just one other question on Washington Street in turn restrictions. Washington Street is Route 16 and 
I am not an expert, but I read Mass DOT controls all turn restrictions on numbered state highways. How much control does Holliston have to control access of trucks on a numbered highway? I think Jay Tellman already touched on that. The implicate, well, I don't want to speak for Jay, but I mean, the implication I think he made was they can suggest, but they can't demand. So did you hear the question, Jay? You're on mute. You're on mute. Are you on mute? Jay's on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was taking notes. Um, what, um, what was the exact question? The Washington Street is a numbered highway. Mass DOT has an advisory that we cannot restrict truck traffic on numbered highways, especially when seeking truck exclusions. What is the town's ability to restrict any kind of truck traffic on a numbered highway? Well, we, we have restrictions under the law on, um, in terms of what we could do on whether they're numbered or local highways in terms of truck exclusions that we have to meet certain requirements to do that um, and work with DOT. As to the fact that it's a numbered highway, even some numbered highways are not really monitored or patrolled per se by the state. They're under local control, but regardless, for us to exclude um, trucks from a specific highway as a formal matter, as a matter of municipal regulation rather than a permit condition, permit condition is different. But if we wanted to make a particular road in town truck free, we would have to work with DOT to make sure we met the standard for that. That doesn't mean that we couldn't work with any particular facility and as a condition of their permit, uh, restrict or prohibit trucking on certain things because that's an enforcement through another regulatory and statutory scheme. So who becomes responsible for enforcement? That would be the building commissioner or whoever we delegated through, but basically it becomes zoning enforcement. Um, you know, obviously the building commissioner could get some help, but the remedy is through the zoning act. Um, so we would have enforcement through those means, uh, initial enforcement with appellate rights to the zoning board and then to court from there. And do we have any concern about Milford? Mass DOT has an application for truck exclusions which require the consent of a third party. Like if we send traffic through Milford, we have to get Milford to concede that it's an acceptable alternative. Again, that, that's on the town-wide basis. You don't have to, as a, as a planning board, you're not required to go through that, that process. If you wanted to, as a condition of a permit for this specific project, restrict or prohibit trucks on a certain road, you can do that outside of that process. Again, if the town wanted to essentially say no trucks in our town, ship them all over to Milford or Medway or whatever, there would be significant scrutiny by the state on that. And there's a number of hoops to jump through to justify those kinds of things. So they're just two different animals. And if- Thank you, John. If, yeah, okay, I'm done, thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, next is Kevin O'Connor. Hi, Kevin. Uh, your mute button is on. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Can you thank hear me? You. All right. Yes. So, so my name is Kevin O'Connor, um, 15 Stable Way, Medway, Mass. A um, couple of points that I'd like to, to raise. First, uh, some of the discussion tonight has been uh, revolving around the, the traffic study. Has any, has, has the, I'd like to suggest that the planning board require the developer to submit a, a traffic use study that encompasses whatever the maximum most intensive use of the property is that it would accommodate. Um, all the studies that I've seen so far have included assumptions about 
uses that are less intensive than what the property will what what the planned development will accommodate and I, I think it should be done the other way around i think it should be there should be a study done as to what the maximum use is that the development they're proposing would accommodate i think what they're proposing clearly would accommodate a high cube fulfillment center use which is far more intensive than what the studies they've been proposed that they've presented to the board uh, uh, deal with. Um, Kevin, and, I want to interrupt you a little bit there. I, sure. I just mentioned a, a little bit ago that we did actually ask them to do that, um, and they did do that. Uh, I don't know if uh, if someone wants to share that, but uh, the, they're not proposing high cube. But they do. They did present those numbers, and they are higher. There's, there's no question about it. And we wanted them to present them because we wanted to know what the worst could be if someone else wanted to convert this, whether it's them or someone else wanted to convert this to high cube, so we could do proper planning around what they're doing. They're proposing what they're proposing, but I agree, and Karen agreed. Uh, a thousand percent that we should know what the worst case scenario would be and and in fact frank was good enough to ask scott to to do that analysis and the numbers are vastly larger no question and i don't know if bob wants to talk about that bob talked about some of the limiting factors where it'd be difficult to put that kind of peg in this hole but we still took a guarded approach to that yeah and is bob is bob still on I, I am. I am here. So let me, so let me I, just sort of make a, a general note and say that every study that we do, whether it be bearing capacity, whether it be, um, uh, you know, material testing, whatever it may be, we do a number of studies with pretty wide spectrums uh, of tolerance, if you will. So we'll say, okay, here's the best case scenario. Here's the worst case scenario. And we usually pick a point in between to say, okay, this is the highest probability of occurrence, meaning we're going to build this, we're going to build that, or this is going to happen. So even though we do that spectrum, right? We want to actually figure out what kind of what kind of spectrum we'll be operating in. But go ahead and, and, and address that, Bob, if you will. Sure. And one of the reasons we asked that a sensitivity analysis be done uh, was to ensure that we're looking at what we would call the highest and best use scenario uh, for the park. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, while it may be theoretically possible to, to build and operate a high cube facility within the park in some form, um, when you look at specific applications, you need to also look at what uh, Attorney Tallerman has correctly pointed out as limiting factors. Um, you know that that would reflect the realities of actually achieving that so-called highest and best use scenario. So in the context of the 800,000 square foot building, where they're only providing 400 surface parking spaces for employees and visitors and, and about 278 uh, trailer spaces, uh, that would represent um, a limiting factor. Um, a high cube facility uh, tends to have a much higher employment level uh, and a shift pattern that obligates much more parking than that. And so, um, uh, the applicant's ability to market and successfully land uh, a tenant that, that wanted to operate a high cube is limited by that reality um, and the reality that the employment is uh, effectively capped at 500 employees on the basis of how they've designed other aspects of the property. Um, so uh, we, we, we did ask that question uh, and we did uh, suggest that they look at the industrial park land use category, which is a broader industrial category that includes a whole range of industrial uses that could be light manufacturing, um, warehousing, uh, distribution facilities and other things that uh, quite frankly are higher, much higher generating than, than the warehouse that's being proposed. So we did ask that that be looked at. We think it was prudent to be looked at. DOT in the ordinary course of reviewing projects typically asks for that same type of an ana analysis. So, so that, um, that, was, that was evaluated in this case. Um, I, I will point out that Vanas did take the time to look at the high cube land use category um, 
uh, specifically and how it would compare to a warehousing use. And there are uh, astronomically different results. Um, but again, um, the assumption of a high cube has to look at the ground conditions and, and the actual context of what's being proposed for parking, number of trailer spaces, et cetera. And, and that's, that, that's the limiting factor. So we believe that the highest and best potential use scenario has in fact been evaluated in this case. So, I mean, that leads to another question on my part, which we, is- I guess we got to, we've got 14 other people. So I've got to jump to the next person because we've got oh, actually more than 14 people. So I've got to just keep, quick, keep going on and try and get, I want to get as many questions in. Um, so thank, thank you for your question. So I don't get another question. I'm being shut off right now. Well, no, but you can come back up. I've just got 14 people. I've got to, I, I want to okay, try and get just, all these questions from everybody. Sure, at this point. sure. I understand that, but just let, let me, let me note that the, the meeting should not end until people's questions have all been asked and answered. Okay. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next is Gary. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I'm here, uh, Gary Rotatory, 14 Old Surrey Lane, Medway, uh, the adjoining abutting neighborhood. Uh, questions, uh, basically, you know, I'll give the question to the board, but it's directed to the representatives from CRG. Uh, they show a number of photos of some of their other warehouse sites across the country. Uh, my wife and I have been looking at many of their sites. There's a couple of things they have in common when you look at their various sites. They're uh, they're adjacent to a major highway in a very industrial zone, no residential areas, or they might be in a very rural area where there's also no residential areas next door to them. So the, the question is, I've yet to see one of these uh, CRG sites right next to a residential neighborhood like we have here in Holliston and Medway. Um, is, is, can they ex tell us if this is outside of the norm for their, for their site selection, or is this, because uh, I've yet to see a site just like this, anything similar to this. So. Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, so no, thank it's you not very much. It's not outside the norm. And so the first box that we check when we go into when we do any of our site analyses is to see what the current zoning is, and that's number one. So you know, oftentimes when you find industrial zoning, it's not right next door to residential properties, right? So that's the answer to one part of those. And 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 the other, I, I guess the other part of that answer would be, but the. the the, the pictures on our websites um, are, are just select projects, right? I do know of three others that are being constructed next to residential neighborhoods. Um, and so it's not out of the norm for us. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, and moving on to the next person would be Donald Taylor. This is Dr. Taylor. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Dr. Donald Taylor, and I'm at the uh, nine Madison Drive in uh, in Holliston. The first thing I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, uh, I was uh, watching this whole thing, and I think that uh, if you're going to limit a time to 9:30, it's now 8:50. It should have limited the time to the people presenting this. Uh, that's number one. Uh, in future, we could do that. Now, let me address the following. I think that CRG is a great corporation, and I think they're a smokescreen for the owner of the property. The owner of the property is uh, John uh, 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 Della uh, Prescoli, and he has quite a history, which I think the town should be aware of. Uh, what he did way back when, when the uh, Edaville Railroad was going to go bankrupt, he purchased it. This is important because he has a track record, and I think you ought to know about what the track record is. He purchased the Edaville Railroad, and he looked up the uh, statistics about what the railroad could do, and he came into a battle with the uh, uh, Ocean Spray Cranberry people about using his land and crossing the railroad tracks, uh, using the uh, laws the govern the railroad and his family to dominate uh, where the railroads went and what they were allowed to do. The uh, Ocean Spray Consortium, your internet connection. Well, maybe I'll talk on the phone. The uh, uh, con 
consortium uh, from the uh, uh, ocean spray came and Della Pasquale uh, got his way. He then uh, uh, went and purchased the Upton Grafton Railroad Company. And if the town wants to find out about what Mr. Della Pasquale does, and he, he never goes into a uh, a uh, uh, an undertaking where uh, the uh, occupancy has not been already figured out. Uh, uh, I respectfully say that CRG, where they say they, they, they don't know what's going in that building, I think if you question John uh, Dallapicoli, you'll know right away what's going in that building. What I hope is that he hasn't transferred ownership to the railroad, because the railroad, you're not going to win. He, he will do whatever he wants, wants to do with that property. Uh, I would like to say one other thing. I was a 36-year resident in the town of Upton. Delapis Crowley had the railroad running across Grove Street, which was about a mile from my house. Uh, what he did is the following. He took the property because he was allowed to, by the Railroad Act, anything that's within 100 feet of the track on either side is can be taken by eminent domain uh, by the owner of the railroad, which he did. He then uh, brought bulldozers in. He didn't need any permits at all. And he scalped the entire property, which was about 150 by 400 feet, and took all of the topsoil, sold that off. My neighbor, who said his house uh, values dropped at that point uh, by 30 percent, and he was sitting on a bluff, uh, but he couldn't do anything about it, uh, said, maybe it's all over. But then Della Piscoli decided that the property that he had just uh, uh, treated the way uh, the people in uh, Appalachia uh, uh, do open pit mining, uh, he brought in some heavy equipment. The town couldn't do anything about it, and he started to mine uh, gravel from that pit. Right now, if you have a, uh, uh, a minute, just drive down Grove Street and look at that lot that's by the railroad track. It's now covered with snow. When it's not, it's, it's covered with weeds, and there's nothing on it. This is the kind of man you're dealing with. Della Piscoli owns the property. There's no way that he does not know what's going into that property now. If it's owned by the railroad, we, we don't have a leg to stand on. It was just put forth that he has got a connection through Franklin. The railroad is going through there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for your doctor. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, and next, I apologize for going quickly. I'm just, I'd like to get everybody's uh, Rami Materi, if I'm pronouncing that. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, uh, no, 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 you're not, but that's okay. It's the Middle I'm, East. I'm sorry, I apologize. That's okay. I it's apologize. Rami, it's Rami Mitri 175 Winthrop. Rami Mitri. Thank yeah. you very much. No, no problem. So I uh, just wanted to check in on, the, I have a couple of questions as well, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Dr. Taylor uh, bringing you know, us up to speed on who the uh, owner is. It's, yes. it, the town has to know that. And if uh, I could just quickly mention, if you could just limit it to one question, I apologize, but you can then get back in the queue. I just have, I want to try and get everybody's, everybody's questions in, but if you could, uh, okay. one of your okay. questions, that would be great. I, Thank I, you very much. Yeah. I, I, I think somebody from the development uh, used the word, uh, the word theoretically occur, that traffic will theoretically occur. Uh, yeah, having two trucks per minute, that's not theoretically occur. We know that there's going to be a traffic jam in this town. Uh, my question is the study itself. When I looked at the traffic pre-COVID and during COVID, the, 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 the backlog into town was 0.6 of a mile. I'm an engineer. I like to measure everything. And then uh, post-COVID, it was 0.3 of a mile. My question on the study itself, it, I, I read that it was done in November 2020, which is during the peak COVID when most offices were closed and traffic is less. Can they redo the study after COVID is, is cleared and then we can understand much better what the traffic situation is? Because frankly, you can show, you can show me all the numbers you want. I don't believe that 18-wheeler trucks are not going to cause issues in this small town here like Holliston. The other thing I just wanted to cover, I, I second 
what um, uh, Gary Rotatori said, I also went on their website. I did not see one warehouse that was situated in a small town like Holliston that had single lane roads in and out. So I'd like to understand a little bit of the study and also I would like the, the board to allow the public to have a time to review the presentations that these people provide so that we can better prepare and have questions than the 10 minute presentation that they wanna do for this town. That's all I have. So, Thank you so very the, much. So on the first, on the first um, issue, uh, the, data, the data that was used for the traffic analyses was collected pre-COVID, correct, Scott? Correct, it was, okay. it was collected in December of 2019. Okay, so so that's the first issue. And the second issue about us not developing in residential areas or one lane roads or anything. Yeah, you know, when we do a, a site selection, you know, you know, I wouldn't even call it a study. I mean, basically we go out, we look for available property. If it checks a number of boxes for us, I mean, it, can't, it doesn't have to be 100% of the boxes. It could be eight out of 10, it could be 12 out of 14. We decide to go after that particular property and see if we can make it work as an investment. So. This particular property appealed to us because of its proximity to 495, to its proximity, its proximity to Boston, and the fact that it does have the appropriate zoning. Um, it does have some top topographical challenges and things of that nature, but you know that's basically how we came to the conclusion. Yeah, but it's not close to 495, so I just wanted to clear that up, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to read a bill. Hello. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Hi, uh, Rita Bell, 37 Locust Street. Um, first of all, I agree with Rami. Um, the site is not adjacent to 495. It's a very convoluted route to get a truck from 495 to 555. Um, my question is about the noise study, which uh, as part of your presentation, sounds like you conducted a noise study already, but it can't be valid because there's no building there yet. There's no operation. Um, my property abuts an industrial area and uh, there is a transfer station on the property. And we're lucky that we, there are at least some operating hours. They cannot start their operation before seven in the morning and they have to end by, by six o'clock at night. Now you're talking about 24 seven and you're gonna have uh, lots, lots of trucks passing through there, a lot of backup alarms. And I can tell you, even though noise studies were done and they said everything was all fine. I can lie in bed and I hear truck backup beepers all the time. So um, the planning board really has to pay close attention because you have a lot of residential properties that are very close to this operation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. I think next. Uh, Janet Sheehan. Hi, Janet Sheehan, 5 Surrey Lane Medway. I'm in a butter. Um, thank you to the chairman and members of the board and the previous caller um, who spoke to the backup beeping noises. I am not looking forward to hearing those at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and all through the night. Um, but my point tonight is to draw attention to a technical memorandum that I came across that was last fall. I did send a copy of it to Karen Sherman. It's 49 pages long, and it is regarding warehousing trip generation review at uh, Bartlett Street in Northborough. They're uh, planning an industrial park there. And there was some very different information that I came across. It seems it's a very, very thorough study. They've done their due diligence and um, they have their uh, principle of traffic planning and operations. And what I was looking for when I was Googling was the definition of the ITE code, like what were the specific numbers. And I do have here in quotes that the definition of 
from IT says a high cube warehouse is a building that typically has at least 200,000 gross square feet of floor area and a ceiling height of 24 feet or more. So I am still really just baffled at, at this being called a general uh, IT code 150 when I'm reading, you know, a direct quote from the IT manual of what defines um, a general warehouse and what defines a high cube warehouse. And this still looks to me like it would be more of a subclass of 154, a transload warehouse. And um, just my final point to speak to the traffic. So, and, and when we're talking about trip generation, um, I think it's important, this, this report, this 49 page memorandum also talks about the types of vehicles that are used for certain purposes. So with this type of warehouse, you're going to have a different um, class of, of vehicles to go through. And what services these facilities are the 18 wheel, you know, multiple axle, huge, long semi tractor trailers. The biggest things that are on the roads right now are what services, and there'll be 1.5 million square foot of storage space that these vehicles will be servicing. So when we're talking about trip generation, I would, I think it would be important to note to make sure it is the right subclass and how many tractor trailers, semis, rigs, whatever you want to call them, are going to be utilizing this facility. I think it's a much different trip than a little two axle, four wheeled car. It's, you know, and, and what do they weigh? Several tons? It's just, it's, um, you know, the space they take up, the noise that they make, the pollution that they make is really substantial and, and very, very significant. And those are the types of vehicles that service these types of warehouses. And I think we, as the public, should know exactly what's going to happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next, I see is Gary. Hi, Gary. Gary on his iPad. Yep. Oh, your mute is on. I'm trying to thank unmute him. Unmuted? Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, Thank I normally you. use my laptop. This is new for me. Oh, no, no, um, no my name is Gary Donlin. I'm a resident of 45 Alberta Lane here in Holliston. And I have one question about the traffic study. Maybe the gentleman who presented it can answer these parts of the question. There are four parts. One, your study was called a vehicle trip projection. Did that include the 500 employees? Second, you showed a January of 20 number in the morning of 104, but your projection in November, that increased by 31% to 136. However, the evening projection from January of 20 went from 72 up 111% to 152. So the second part of the traffic question is, why the difference? What assumption allowed you to consider a 31% increase in the morning, but 111% increase at night. The third question is, what is the current number on your chart showing daily trips comparison? You didn't show a column prior to column A. Column A you called existing and planned 3456. But if I heard correctly, the existing is 3,200. Now, a member of the board, Karen, asked a question earlier, and you were she was told she was correct, that that is about a 20% increase, going from column A, 3,456, to column B with the 555 project, 4,766, she calculated was around a 20% increase. It's a little math error, but it's actually a 38% increase. But hold on, that's based on the number right now of 3456, which we in Holliston are living with. We're living with the number of 3200. That wasn't on your chart. You verbally said it. 3200 up to 4766 is 45%. So 555 Hoppingbrook, in addition to the work already being planned, will cause a 45% increase 
in a daily trip comparison. So my last question is, can someone tell me if my math is wrong? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, Scott, are you, are, I assume that you're writing down these questions. You're, you're on mute. Before you. <laughs> I, I, I am, I, yeah, I'm doing my best to write them down. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Can, okay. Mr. Chair, can I, can I answer the questions? Sir, uh, we, I'm just trying to think what's yeah. the best way. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. just quickly uh, answer this question and let's, and then, because uh, I'm still going to try and get a lot of these. But yes, let's, let's um, if you could answer this, that, that would be great. Yeah, I know sure. you're noting all these questions, but if we could um, answer this. Yeah, so, so in terms of the, the, the first part, the vehicle trip projections does include the 500 employees. In terms of the of the January to November numbers, how the how the the trips changed, uh, the the January 2020 memo was prepared by uh, by a different consultant, and uh, when we looked at the we were brought on to look at the at the project, uh, we thought that the use of um, of a standard warehouse rate uh, or standard warehouse statistics was more appropriate. What they had used previously were uh, some uh, counts from, from another study, uh, not, not the standard source. Um, uh, the third part, the, the current daily number, and I'm rushing to get through this, but the, the current daily number, you're right, it's, it's, it's 3,034. Uh, I combined the existing trips with what we expect the sites that are currently under construction to uh, to generate. I combined those numbers together to get the thirty four fifty six because I I was just trying to to get through the numbers uh, quickly. So um, so and I haven't run the I haven't run the percentage the percentage increases. I will do that for next time um, and and uh, you know we can compare math notes uh, afterwards. Mr. Chairman, I just want to point out that the current number of 3,034, I misspoke. I thought it was, he said 3,200. So to your board member Karen's question, compared to our current living situation, 3,034, to go to 555 Hoppingbrook, daily trips per year chart, go to 4,766. That's almost a 60% increase, six zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, next, we have Matthew on the call. Yes, thank you uh, for for uh, uh, listening to me. First, first off, I'd like to say that I think this absolutely has to be continued. Um, I think the folks that presented earlier did a great job of burning time. So that's number one. Uh, number two. Could I get your address? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, yeah, excuse me, oh, sir. Sorry. So uh, uh, number four, Old Surrey Lane in okay. Medway, Matthew Minch. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, Thank you. No, no problem. My fault. Um, so number one, burning of time. This needs to be continued. We've got 20 minutes left, um, which I don't agree with. But, you know, nonetheless, that's wh that's where we're at. The 24-7 operation, I'll, I'll focus on that. There's many other issues to focus on, but the 24-7 operation, you've already decided that the tree removal uh, and the harvesting of trees would be restricted to certain hours. And I compel the board to require that this facility, if it gets approved, to restrict the hours of operation, at least outside, to a reasonable amount of time for the abutting folks and, and other neighbors. It's not just the, the, the town of Medway, it's Holliston, it's Milford too. Um, and I think that's a reasonable request. Um, they can operate 24 seven indoors, doing whatever they're gonna do, but you know, for having backup uh, beacons and, and so forth uh, and, and trucks coming in and out 24, seven I think is completely unreasonable. I'll, I'll limit my, um, my comments to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Carrie. 
Good evening. I have uh, never endured such fuzzy math in my life. However, I being a former address, Marine, I admit that sometimes I cannot count properly. I'm sorry, I live I at 2290 address? Washington Street. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are days I cannot get out of my driveway for 15 to 20 minutes at the present rate of traffic. The only real question I have for you folks is, have you done a study on how the 40 to 60 percent increase in traffic will devalue the worth of my home and how much you will lower my taxes to compensate me for that? That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, next would be Steve. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Steve McElhinney, 12 Carriage House Way. Um, Good evening. Uh, first off, uh, thank you to the board and the chairman. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time and putting the effort into uh, listening to everything here. Um, the first comment, just uh, just responding back to Gary's iPad, is math is 100% correct. Um, the one math figure he didn't, he didn't add to that was that the full build out um, with 5,918 trips generated, that is a 95% increase in what is going on there today. So just to put that in perspective for the town, we're talking from what the town is seeing today, uh, with the 800,000 square foot build out, we're seeing a 57% increase in traffic. And then with the full build out, we're seeing a 95% increase in traffic. I just wanted to say that to start. Um, the question I had was, um, during uh, Mr. Uh, um presentation, and I apologize if I pronounced the name correctly. Um, I thought I heard him say uh, during his presentation that in order to make the project compliant, um, they made um, all these changes, including adding the berm, pushing, pushing uh, the, uh, the building further from uh, the property lines, whatever. Um, what I'm hearing is that a non-compliant project was put in front of the town asking for their approval originally. And now when we do the noise study, now we're trying to put a compliant project in front of the town. Um, I don't know what the other studies are going to show us afterwards, but did I hear that correctly? Uh, I, you know, maybe if you heard it correctly, maybe I said it incorrectly. So, what, you know, relative to the noise study, I mean, the point I was trying to make is that, hey, look, we did a noise study, and we really looked at the information contained therein. And we thought to ourselves, you know, there, you know, and inclusive of all the designs, design changes that we've made on the site, we've gotten rid of trailer spaces and this and that and built berms. We just thought that, you know, now packaged with the amenities that we're offering and the design changes, that everything is fully compliant. You know, whether or not that was a result of this, I didn't mean to say that, but what I am saying now is that we're doing things to make everything really a little bit more acceptable and to address the concerns that, that are apparent. Understood. Um, and the one thing with that is um, changing the where you put the guard shack in the traffic pattern, but that still doesn't increase the trucks driving past my house, because now you're saying they come in at the guard at the, at the new um, guard booth, they have to drive all the way around the building because it looks like it's one way. So I'm still getting every truck going past my house. No, it's not one way. It's two ways. So, so, you know, again, that was a result of a resident calling and saying, hey, you know, it it kind of looks like they, you know, if you look at the site plan, I think the corner that is, you know, closest to the residence, if you will, is that particular corner where the south road runs. And his suggestion to me was, like, you know, he explained it to me when he was looking at the plans. Is that it looks as though you're directing all your traffic up at this up this road. And my response to it was, well, I can see how you can see that, but so here's what we're going to do to change the optics: is we're going to make that bigger road on the western side of the building, if you will, which is the, the lower part of the site plan. And we're going to make the road that runs along the southern side of the building smaller in width, get rid of the guard check, just to make it basically um, flow better for trucks to go straight onto the southern side of the building. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it is it safe to say that for the truck docks where the guard check is, 
the residents in the back will not have those trucks drive past their homes. Yes, it is. Because if you look at the site plan again, if they drive in on the south road to get into the truck court that is furthest away from the Midway residence, they would take a right-hand turn right into the truck court. Correct. And then they would go back out via the guard shack again and not go across the resident side of the... Yes, because uh, there's no connection of that truck court to the southern side. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have, uh, uh, again, a uh, Fowler. I'm, I've got to put my glasses on here. Uh, oh. Yeah, hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, Mike Fowler, 124 South Street in Holliston. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I just want to say I'm encouraged by the board pushing for restrictions for traffic on South Street. Um, I just really hope that you guys can come up with something that's enforceable. Um, you know, the the applicant promised to keep logging traffic off of South Street, and that's something that we've seen uh, not happening as of this week. So that's one point. Um, however, even if his traffic is limited from South Street, this still introduces a significant amount of traffic, obviously, to Western Holliston. Um, I noticed the traffic studies do not include the intersection with South Street and Cortland, um, which frankly is already a dangerous intersection. Um, and that intersection is only about 500 feet from the Hopping Brook entrance. Um, so I just, I'm curious, is there any plan to address the, uh, that intersection in terms of, you know, does it need a light? That's just my point um, I wanted to make about that. So that's it. Thanks. So I'm going to call Thank you very much. Scott, did you hear that question? Was that intersection in the scope of study? Was it considered and... It, it was not in the scope of study, uh, but it's most likely going to be covered in the in the, uh, the study that gets done from MEPA. Okay. But the, but the town will get a copy of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next is Scott, and I believe the last name is Carmen. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, my name is Scott Carmen. I'm an attorney at 141 Tremont Street in Boston, Massachusetts. I represent a group of the uh, Medway Abutters. Um, I trust that you had a chance to review my letter of last week. I just want to touch upon that briefly for a few moments here, uh, primarily for the benefit of the Holliston uh, residents who wouldn't, who wouldn't know about the contents of that letter and, and the important attachments there too. Um, as stated in my letter, um, we asked a number of questions of, of the developer um, in discovery in our, in our uh, litigation appeal of the height variance, which Mr. Bemis, Bemis answered under oath. Um, many questions that are critical to the findings you need to make. And in some of these answers under oath, Mr. Bemis said it was unknown as to how many vehicles would come and go from the property per day. It is unknown how many tractor trailers would be on the property at any given time. It is unknown what type of machinery and equipment would ever be on the property. Um, you need to make findings concerning traffic, uh, safe and vehicular and pedestrian access on adjacent streets uh, and properties, no significant emission of noise. I simply cannot see how you could ever make those findings uh, required by your bylaw to issue a special permit when they admit that they do not have any of this critical information. Um, it's probably because the uh, ultimate use of this property always has been and remains amorphous and seems to change on a constant basis when the board seems to get concerned about things and sour on some presentations that are made. Um, Mr. Bemis attests under oath in these same answers, it will be some form of a wholesale office, showroom, and or warehouse facility. Uh, at your last hearing when Attorney Taylorman was very concerned about the, the uh, unspecific use, um, uh, Chip Nyland emphatically stated it is not high cube, um, but nevertheless, Peter Bemis' uh, technical memorandum of a year ago states, I quote, the project is a proposed 800,000 square foot high cube warehouse. If you go on CRG's website, when they boast many of their projects, uh, there's a whole section on the high cubes at Glendale, for example, and many, many other locations. Um, they are asking you to approve this project and the special permit partially blindfolded which is always an improper ask of a local board and certainly most improper here where this is the biggest commercial project the town of Holliston probably will ever, ever see and certainly has ever seen up to this point in time. 
Uh, lastly, uh, just about procedure. Um, as of last week now, uh, you've been presented with an entirely new site plan to name a few of the changes, the building has moved uh, a couple hundred feet. The parking configuration, number of parking spaces has changed significantly. There's been a berm added. Um, the site plan uh, review bylaw specifically states that uh, a building permit has to issue on the site plan that was approved. The site plan that you approved now is of no moment because you've been presented with an entirely new site plan. Um, the only way that that previous site plan approval could have any value or utility is if the changes were deemed minor. Uh, they're clearly not. Um, these are significant changes to the site plan. Site plan review is always the threshold step in local permitting for a large project. So I would suggest to the board that these special permit proceedings be held in abeyance and they start over with the new site plan what they've now presented you with. Otherwise, um, this project is happening in reverse. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Chip Nye. Could I just re respond very, very quickly? Yes, sir. So three things I'd like to say. First of all, and, and, and thank you for tonight, but um, there will be a continuation. We, we submitted a noise study, which is being peer reviewed. So this is not the last hearing and it will be continued. Uh, second, with respect to what took place with Mr. Bemis, he's not the developer, he was an engineer. He was asked questions a year ago before noise study and traffic studies, so he answered correctly what was in front of him. You know, the burden has been on us, and, and we haven't burned time tonight, Mr. Chairman. We've been attempting to provide the board and the residents what they've asked for, which is what does this project look like? What, you know, what are the buildings going to look like? What kind of traffic is going to be generated? So we're answering those questions for um, the board. And third, with respect to the site plan, you know, we read the uh, site plan approval the same way that you do. If there's a modification of site plan approval, then we have to come back and request that. And we will be requesting that, but I think it can be done concurrent with this process. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to continue to answer questions because I'm, I'd like to get uh, uh, everybody's questions answered. Um, next on the list is Tom Fitzgerald. Hi, thank you for the time. Tom Fitzgerald, 61 Rockland Street in Holliston. Thank um, you very much. A lot of the discussion obviously around traffic, but I, I do want to address the study and the economic impact report that was delivered to the board. Um, I think it was about two months back and it was in the, the town paper today. Um, you know, first off, I not against uh, the process of providing special permits um, when all the facts are presented, you know, the positives outweigh the negatives in the town with the residents included and our neighbors are in agreement. Um, obviously that's, not the case and the positives that's been presented to us are minimal in nature and sadly have not been fully vetted. The economic impact report that was delivered by the Economic Development Committee shows a nice figure of a million dollars in additional tax revenue. However, having this figure presented as an economic impact to the town is a farce. What happens to the home values and residential tax revenue what happens when the hundreds, if not potentially thousands, as this building expands, daily nonstop 18 wheelers destroy our roads and drive away potential new residents? How much of the million dollars that is gained be used on just road repairs from this increase in traffic? Um, what happens when the tenant who still hasn't been identified has more demands? And what if they continually expand? These are the types of variables that need to be questioned and considered and presented. Uh, they have not, so I feel like the board cannot consider the recommendation by the Economic Development Committee as complete or valid. But if we are to go along with the picture of a million dollars in tax revenue, you know, just for everybody to be clear of, that's only roughly 2% of the total tax revenue of the town that was received last year. That's between residential and commercial combined. Um, I feel like that can be pretty much made up in a blink of an eye with the regular tax increases that we live with today. Uh, I do have other comments, but I'll hold them till the next meeting as I hope this is continued. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And next we have Tears Stifler. I'm sorry, and again, I apologize. I should have brought better glasses. Tara. 
Terry, I'm sorry, Terry. Terry. Hi, yes, this is Terry Stifler. Actually, I'm sorry, I don't know how to change that on my uh, board there. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize um, for reading some of these wrong. I just, I, it's hard to read, but also I apologize. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. No, that's okay. My name is Terry Stifler and um, I live at 58 Front Street in Holliston. Um, and I have a, um, both an engineering and an environmental background. So I would like to get at a couple of those, um, maybe one or two questions related to that. Um, first off, uh, I completely agree that the numbers that they were saying in the beginning, I had a 35% increase until he dropped it down to the 30, 34. So I think it's 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 pretty straightforward math that it, it is quite an increase that's whether it's 35% or it goes up to 95%. Um, but one of the questions, uh, I've come in late on this project a little bit, so I'm wondering if there's been any environmental impact assessment done on this on this land. Um, I did a I went into Google Earth and took a deep dive a little bit more onto this. And it looks like there's a river going through it. Um, I have questions about the fact that um, MEPA calls out that if you have more than 10 acres of impervious surface, I think that's a threshold that's hit and then it requires uh, some impact assessment. Uh, and this building alone is gonna be 18, this 800,000 is 18 acres. And that doesn't even count the, uh, the uh, acreage of the surrounding parking lot and the additional 700,000 foot, uh, square foot facility that's coming in. Um, my concern is that river, um, could it could affect um, our water quality. It could affect, uh, it, I think it feeds over into the conservation area across the street. Um, it could also impact flooding issues. Uh, there could be aquatic species. We've, we've um, identified at least 17 uh, endangered species in our community. And I'm not sure if they've taken any look on that site to see if any of them are existent there. Um, I'm wondering uh, if these guys won't tell you who they are that are coming into the site, um, will they tell us what they're gonna be bringing in? Is there any hazardous materials that may be coming into that site? That will, that will invoke, uh, I would say RICRA should be called in on that one, um, where they'll have to look at toxic and considerations for hazardous materials. Um, I think those are the main things and also the drawdown on the water that's gonna be required for that site. I don't know if there's any been any assessment on any of this and there's several other pieces of this that I think have to be considered if it was a more in-depth environmental assessment of that site. And that, that if, and, and these increase in uh, truck traffic is going to have a health issue on our community as well with the increased uh, pollution coming out of these vehicles, which I'm sure is not going to be electric vehicles. So I just wanted to put those points across and I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, so thank quick, you very much. Thank you. Can I quickly respond? Yes. So the yes. answer is yes. We have looked at all those studies. Everything came back clean. We have conservation information. We have I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We've already done all the requisite studies required by all the insular jurisdictions, including Township of Holliston, Conservation Commission, all the jurisdictions. And, and recall that we already have a site plan approval here. So yes, we have done all of those studies. Um, everything passed uh, scrutiny from all those jurisdictions. And I think the other you know, suggestion that you had made about what's being done in the building. So as I addressed that, you know, all of our tenants deal with consumer goods, right? Hazmats are strictly prohibited from our building. And I do agree with you. If anybody wanted to bring hazmat to the building, they would have to get uh, special permits from different agencies. So that wouldn't be an issue. I was wondering though about MEPA in particular, and, and I haven't seen any of those environmental documents yes, we have. on the Holliston site. Yes, we have, we have MEPA. We have MEPA approvals. You have it for the transportation, right? But is that also for the environmental? It's for everything. It's a blanket MEPA permit, section 61 specific for the MSDOT, and they contributed to the review. Okay, because I tried to go out and find that on the MEPA site, and I only found one from back in like 2002. So for this, for this particular project. So if that could be made available, I, I would be very interested in seeing that. Is that on the Holliston site? Peter? No, no. 
Um, all this is public documents, and, and the, the park was fully vetted again in 2003 and then recently. So um, I, I, I don't know why you couldn't find the documents, but they are available. Could you put something on the Holliston site so that we can get at that? Because I, I looked out on the MEPA site, and the only one I found was the old 2002 or 2003 document. So that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Nothing current. Okay. We will look into that. Thank you very much. Um, tell Peter there's nothing current. There's nothing current at this point. Just so you know, Peter, there's nothing current. Okay. Uh, well, no, we updated. Um, we, we've been working with with, uh, with the uh, MEPA unit. Um, when did you update it? Was it this morning? No, <laughs> no. Within the last year. I mean, that's all. All of this, these dealings uh, with them have been over the la the course of the last year. Uh, okay. That's not what. I, that's not the word that's coming into my ears right now. So I'm going to do my own research, I guess. No, okay. okay. No, I, I can assure you, we have. Can, yeah, this is Chip. Uh, this is Chip. Now, can I just clarify that, Mr. Chairman? We, yes. we filed information, sought an advisory opinion in 2020, and as a result of going through all of that process with MEPA and review, which was a public document, as Peter indicated, they issued the 61 finding. As uh, Scott and others have talked about, there's a notice of project change that will be filed, which will update the traffic information and the other matters that are in front of MEPA. So, but that in terms of other matters being vetted, they have been vetted and it will continue to be vetted. But uh, Scott has referred to that a couple of times tonight in terms of up updating the traffic analysis as part of the next MEPA filing. Okay. I guess at this point we'll go on to Liam. I'm just noting this, but thank you. Uh, if we could go on to Liam. Uh, hi, Liam O'Sullivan. I'm at 175 Fisk Street. Um, thank you. I think they may have just alluded to it. Maybe it's the MEPA uh, study that will be updated, but all, all the traffic concerns and numbers that everybody's talking about are all just related to the counts and that's coming directly out of Hoppingbrook Road in that one intersection, you know, it would be probably essential to understand how this is affecting, you know, going west to Milford, you know, what, what type of increase we're seeing on that road. What are we going to be seeing at what Route 126 intersection, even going as far as is Highland Street? You know, what are those impact going to be at places that we already have, you know, significant traffic issues? you know, during during the rush hours, and I would hope that that would be included in, in further studies. That's all. Thank you very much. I think that's that's huge concern, some of these other parts of town, um, either taking a left or a right um, to really review and, and look at the impact of, of these. Um, I think certainly several people have mentioned that tonight. Um, yeah, and Dave, I think that we had asked that a while ago, right? We had talked about the South Street intersection in Cortland. We, we had brought this up before. Yep. I see the next person is uh, Susan Adelman. How are you? Oh, Good evening. Hi, how, how are, are you? you? How are you? I'm getting tired and hungry. I'm sure everybody else is too. Okay. Um, first off, I want to thank the 120 people that stuck with us tonight to talk about this. I know that this project is a big surprise to a lot of people here in Holliston. And I think it's incredibly important that everyone understand the magnitude of what is proposed up on that hill. Um, a truck is a long haul truck. They're 53 feet long. I believe they're almost 14 feet tall. When you talk about that amount of traffic in and out of that facility, it's just mind boggling. Um, we have heard a lot of facts and figures tonight um, on a very personal level. Oh, by the way, I'm calling from South Street. Um, on a very personal level for us, this is devastating. 
and we really need assurance from Holliston and from the planning board and everyone concerned that you will do your very best to protect this street from this kind of traffic. Even over the weekend when they started the log out, we were assured that we weren't going to see any um, traffic for their log out, but they were there, which just proves to us that you really can't control it. So again, I want to thank the 120 people that have stuck with us tonight. I really hope the planning board thinks long and hard about this because once it's in, there's no going back. I don't personally believe a million dollars a year in taxes is worth it. When the traffic from here out to 495 is backed up by these gigantic trucks in and out, our quality of life, I don't think it's worth it. Do we need things in Holliston? Absolutely. I think we need a new high school. We got to take care of our water. We've got some things we need money for, but something's not right here. Mostly, well, not mostly, but I think it's truly important that the planning board steps up and helps out people that live along Washington Street and South Street and the, the neighbors around us. Um, this is a serious thing. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to get your address. I'm sorry. Um, you, you've got our address. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and next we have uh, Wit's new iPhone. Wit's new iPhone. Wit's new iPhone. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me? We can yes. hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, my name is Jane Whitney Grand Mason. I live at 32 Stable Way in Medway. Um, I'm a direct abutter of this this um, project. And my, um, well, I guess my first question, which I, I will reserve my second one for the end of the queue, but um, the structure that will be going in directly behind my property is not the 800,000 square foot building. It's one of the smaller buildings. And there really has been minimal conversation about those buildings. So I guess my question is, what is going on with those other buildings? When will we, when will we hear more about them? Um, and I'd love to see some sort of site plan that, that shows me what I can expect in terms of um, being a direct abutter of that property, whether it's a berm or um, some sort of um, space like the evergreens that they were talking about planting. Um, I guess just more information about the other buildings because the scope of this project is 1.5 million square feet in total, not just the 800,000 square foot building. Thank you. So, so the, the application we have in is for the 800,000, so there's really no consideration for anything else other than that. I, mean, I, I think we had to do larger studies to anticipate full build out of the, pro, of the property with respect to, I, I would say, traffic and different things. But right now, we're only planning the 800. That's the only application that we have active. So at this point, that's the only one we're talking about. Um, I have not heard anything about the other ones. So uh, if I could, the next person I believe is it's a whole bunch of eight W I D W L. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hi, um, thanks. Hi, right, hold on one second. Let me get some new to this. Hi, my name is Dave Wolfson. I live at 293 South Street. Thank um, you very much. Butter. I also am a business owner up in Hoppingbrook. Um, this project is insanity. There's no other way about it. There's one entrance into the park, one only. You cannot widen that entrance because you have wetlands on either side. You cannot put a stoplight there. The amount of traffic is just mind-boggling that it would be with this amount of traffic. It's not made for it with one entrance and one exit. Um, I've seen South Street change. When we bought the property in 94, uh, 95, where Medway was a dirt road. So it's basically a one-way street. So over the years, we've developed a traffic pattern that's become a cut-through. 18 wheelers cross that road on a daily basis sometimes by the hundreds, shake breaks going off. It's a rural county road. 
So this affects us greatly. But I don't think the people on the other end of Holliston understand the traffic that it's going to cause them. Um, you can't get through Holliston in the middle of the day. So to increase the traffic and what they're talking about is insanity. The town's not made for this. It, 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 it doesn't have the single lane roads. It's not near the highway. Another thought they brought up tonight, we got fire department. Do we have enough adequate trucks, firemen? It's a large building. High roofs, do we have any of that in our infrastructure? No. The other thing is, the gentleman earlier tonight brought about the railroad. Now, I don't know if the, we live in a butter to the rail trail. So by the gentleman that owns this property, is that rail trail, can it be taken by intimate domain and become a railroad again? Because then again, it becomes a budding right to Hopping Brook Park. How convenient would that be? This is just, I heard that's the first time of that the gentleman that owns the property. But needless to say, this town cannot handle it. A million dollars is not gonna fix anything in this town, okay? It's just, you can't get in and out of Hopping Brook during the day at between four o'clock and five o'clock. Never mind the traffic stops on Route 16 from 126 to Milford. It'll be a constant crawl. In downtown Holliston, it's bad enough now. We'll wait till you see what happens. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, and then next we have Len Epstein. Hi, this is Len Epstein. I'm at 81 Jackson Drive in Holliston. Thank I, you very uh, much. I have two issues, but I think one's been over discussed. I only have one comment with regard to that. In the traffic study, it would be nice if they differentiate between cars and 18 wheel trucks. I don't consider them to be equal in any traffic study and they should be taken into account. The other thing that I have a major issue with, I appreciate the work that you people have done for noise abatement and moving the property and everything with regard to the abutters in Medway. I have seen absolutely nothing about what you're doing about noise, light, and visual interference of abutters in Holliston, specifically in the north and west-northwest of the area. We are right on the edge of that property, and I'd like to know what's going to be done about it. So on the northern side, we're running the berm around that. We're running the berm around the north side. I've, seen, I've seen no studies that say what, what, whether there's any noise abatement. You're going to be doing 24-7. There's going to be trucks moving in and out of there with the noise that they make. I've seen nobody do any studies to see whether that can be heard down in the, in the residential area. Tell them about moving off source. Peter, Peter I'm, I'm correct, right? We did we did do a berm around the north side of the property. Right, we have a continuous berm. That was the intent, and uh, the, the sound study was not. We, we've submitted it. It's out for peer review. We were not going to discuss it this evening, um, but uh, yes, it does include uh, full analysis for the site. Yeah, I, I've have, I've attended the last three or four meetings. And I've heard even no discussion about uh, about this side of the property. All I see is, is Medway, and I see berms and trees and, and visual siding, and I see nothing about the north side. So we put it, we'd like to see something. This is Holliston, isn't it? Yeah, we put a graphic up earlier on tonight, and we and we showed where the berm would go on the north side of the property. And as Peter just said, we, we commissioned the noise study that's been submitted, hasn't been reviewed by the, or it's in peer review, correct, Peter? Yes, yes, but Ms. Epstein's point is that, is that we focused on the Medway side, and, and, and uh, yes, sir, I will agree with you, the intent was in that exhibit to emphasize the Medway side. I will do one that, that references the Hollison side as well. So. I'd like to know about the ability, what the noise level is going to be 24-7 with trucks backing up and everything coming across that area, how much the sound carries. That, that the, study, the study is the full, full analysis of the site. I, I will uh, assure you of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, next, I see Ann. How are you? I think you're on mute. I, I think you're still on mute. 
Great. Oh, thank I you. got thank a message the host wasn't allowing it, but okay, I'm thank in. you. Thank you. I'm thank Ann you McElhinney, much. and I'm um, a resident at 12 Carriage House Way in Medway. And um, I've become quite familiar with this project since June when I was first alerted about it through a letter. And I've tried to really follow the details of it um, and understand the facts of it, um, So, uh, which has been challenging, but uh, we're doing our best. Just a couple of things I just wanted to try to clarify that have come up. One about the MEPA question. Um, my understanding is that um, CRG has tried to avoid any further MEPA filings in May in 2020. That MEPA said um, that they needed to file a project, they needed to do a, a project change and you were to do that in September. And so I think that has not still been done. That's the latest that I know. So I really would like that clarified because my understanding is that under MEPA, uh, you can't separate the 800 square foot part from the rest of the project. Um, and then the other question about the conservation that um, Ms. Stifler brought up. There's a lot of information back from last summer when several of us met with the Holliston Conservation um, Commission regarding uh, everything that we know about the land back there and what is, um, you know, what all, all types of, um, you know, protected Bernal's protected species and things. And, you know, Holston Commission does have plenty of information that we provided. The problem was uh, that the approval was given this time last year. So think last December and January when it's cold and there's snow on the ground, but that's when the determination was given about the status of the um, conservation. And so they were given an approval and that's apparently good for three years. But I think that was um, that was done without really anyone in Holliston knowing about it and certainly anyone in Medway. So that's just two um, side pieces. But I would like um, Mr. Petkunis to provide, and he can follow up tomorrow, um, but provide some of the detail regarding, uh, he said that he, there were at least three CRG uh, large scale warehouses of this size that abut neighborhoods that you currently have. So I would really like to see the detail on that because I've done a lot of research on warehouses the past six months and I have not seen anything that's 800,000 square foot or even in that realm, even larger, you know, than four or 500,000 that would be situated similarly to what we would experience. So I would love to see kind of in those situations, how you handled, uh, how you mitigated for sound, smell, um, sight for the neighborhood that was abutting this huge warehouse we have in other areas. So I'd appreciate maybe if you could provide that detail to us. Be helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Don has been waiting in the chat. And uh, Don, okay. Uh, Don, I think if Don is there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Don Fennery from One uh, Summit Road in Medway, uh, where I'm going to butter. Uh, wow, this is a lot of information, that uh, new information that's come out. And I'm still kind of floored about the percentage increase in the traffic. Um, but my questions regarding the... Um, the berm. Uh, there's a, uh, a berm that they have in the new plan. Is the uh, is what is written on your new plan? Is that an accurate representation of what that berm is going to look like? Number one, you know, with the slope and the way it the way it looks in your diagram. Uh, and secondly, I see there's a fence on top of there. Um, is that a how tall is that fence? Is it a is it a soundproof fence? Is what the exact type of fence is that? And I see you also have a little tree up there. Now, are those are those are evergreens? Are they how tall are those? I mean, what is the plan with that? So, so the first question is: Is it accurate? Yes. 
Um, the second question, it's an eight foot fence. We talked about that in the original presentation earlier tonight. And on the evergreens, your question was how tall are they? Yeah, is it, I mean, are we talking about they're going to be, you know, trees that only grow to 10 feet or 12 yeah, feet? I, or I think they're only going to be, uh, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about six to eight foot trees to basically shield the monotonous uniformity of the fence. That's right. That's right. But they, they would grow to a, a, a full a full tree. I mean, yeah. they, we were planning on spruces, so they, they, they will get full height. Yeah, you know, 40 feet. It's a, it's a big, big increase. And, um, and as far as the sound attenuation of that particular wall, we did have a spec. It was on the plan, I thought. Can you comment to that? Yeah, it was a buff tech fence. Uh, it was the same fence we proposed the first time. So it, it has some proofing qualities as well. So, so you're going to carry that fence over to the new design because I, okay, it wasn't on that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm trying to get, uh, there's a few people here that have not had their questions answered, and there's a few people that I think we have not called on Mark. Hello? Can you, yeah, can you hear me? It's telling me that I, you, I can't unmute myself. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Sure. So, so my name is Mark Dumichel. I live at 3 Old Surrey Lane, uh, Medway, Mass. Uh, I'm one of the uh, Medway abutters. Much. Sure. Um, I, I guess I'd kind of like to take a, a step back and look at this project um, from, a, from a high level. Um, for personal reasons, I haven't been able to be continuously engaged. Those included some COVID diagnoses in my family and so forth. So if I'm covering territory that's already been covered, um, I apologize and please bear with me. Um, I did watch uh, a hearing from uh, back last summer where Mr. Bemis uh, commented that um, there were those abutters who perhaps thought that maybe there'd never be anything developed behind us, that the land has always been uh, zoned industrial and, you know, we should have gone in with our uh, eyes wide open for, um, you know, lack of a, of a better phrase. And uh, I'm not in that group. Um, you know, I, what I would put myself in is, is a group who bought properties and I, my wife and I bought in June of 2002 with a reasonable expectation that what someday would be back there um, would be a campus style development um, similar to what's there now. I, I don't think a reasonable person would ever have contemplated that a warehouse that consists of 41.6 million cubic feet of space, and I emphasize cubic feet because we keep talking about these buildings in terms of square footage, but they're three dimensional structures. And to fully get your arms around this, I think you need to think of them in terms of the, the, the full scope of um, how big they are. So um, when we look at this from, from a higher level, I think what a reasonable person would do is kind of go to the bylaws and try to make their own assessment of um, what the bylaws say and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Uh, in my doing that, you know, I come across words like uh, harmony, character, and scale. And if I were to lump those three words together, I would put them as uh, similarly situated. So when I, when I look at this and I look at the properties that are around it, I guess, I guess I'd like to ask the board um, individually and collectively, what metrics were used to reach the conclusion? And I have to assume that this conclusion has been reached, otherwise we wouldn't have progressed this far along uh, down the evaluation. But uh, what metrics were used to say that yes, this building checks the box of harmony, checks the box of character, and checks the box of scale. Because quite frankly, I can't get there. Directing of the board, I'll start. No, 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 it's a Jay question. Please, please. No question. Go yeah. um, We have a town council here, and um, um, Attorney Tellerman is here. Um, I don't know if he had any thing in regards to this I think he's still in this call so what what was the the, the question was a process or it was almost like a well in, in reading the bylaws you use words harmony character and scale and it seems to me that well they, they haven't made those determinations yet that's for the ultimate this is an evidentiary process so the for lack of, of a better word, it's kind of like a, a trial, not really, but the uh, applicant has a burden and they have to present all of the evidence that supports meeting those standards. It's not 
It's not reach a milestone, move on, reach a milestone. There are other approvals too, where they had the same thing. And here they have to present all of that stuff to meet all those standards. Mm -hmm. And then the planning board is gonna spend some time after the public hearing deciding if they did that. And if they determine that they did, then they'll issue a decision that approves it with conditions. Well, you've already issued a site plan approval. And if I well, read- Well, site plan approval is a different standard. Well, I'm reading right here from your site plan approval. More specifically, site plan review is intended to ensure that development within the town shall, to the extent reasonably possible, harmonize with the neighboring land uses and structures. So what criteria was used to reach the conclusion that this building is in harmony with other buildings that are in a contiguous area? Well, so two things about the site plan approval. The, the first is we're not here to discuss that. And if people don't agree with that decision then they have potential remedies, which I'm not gonna counsel on. The, the second is, is that under Massachusetts law, the way site, most site plan approvals work is there's no discretion on the part of the board to say no, unless it doesn't meet the four corners of the plan submission detail. So the board doesn't lack um, or doesn't possess as much authority as they do in the special permit process to the extent that the, um, there's kind of a hierarchy of the permits of importance uh, where there's a discretion of the board to say no or to say yes um, under certain conditions, this is it. This is the permit that everyone should keep an eye on because this is the bigger, um, uh, you know, has more oomph to it than anything else in the applicant. The board has more authority and the applicant has to prove more here than they did under site plan review. Site plan review is more of an exercise of checking boxes. And this is more of an exercise of um, testing the board's judgment on behalf of the town. So the site plan review is behind us. Uh, the board's not considering those standards here and people should keep their eye on what is um, on the table here. Okay, I did say I wanted to take a step back. Can I just opine a little bit further here? Um, one of the other things that Mr. Beam has testified to was that the land, um, he was actually did it quite boastfully, was that the land was selling for over $200,000 um, an acre. Um, I would suggest that there's a significant zero sum component to that in that the, the excess value that's being derived by what I consider a huge overreach on a number of levels by what's being attempted to be built back there is coming at the expense of the abutters and the, the owners of neighboring properties. And um, I don't think that's right. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna make a motion right now to continue this public hearing to the next meeting. Okay. It's 10 o'clock, we went 30 minutes over what we want to do. Everyone's gotten to speak. So okay. Josh has made a motion at this point to continue this hearing to the next meeting. Uh, do I have a second? We need to go to a date and time okay. starts and please. So okay. You had put the 25th on the schedule. Is that what you're aiming for? February 25th? 715. February 25th, okay. 715. That's fine. 715. Or okay. seven. Even seven is fine. Okay, seven. And we can have council with us on that? Jay, did you hear that? The 25th? He's here. He's yes? Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, he is yes. So uh, we have a motion uh, to continue this hearing to February 25th at 7, who did we say 15? Or 7, 7, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Maybe so we can get a couple things done. 7 o'clock. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Karen is second that. All in favor, I will start with uh, Karen. Aye. Okay, Scott. Aye. All right. Uh, Jason. Aye. Okay, Josh. Aye. And David, aye. And um, with that, I want to thank everybody who's on this call. Um, and uh, we really appreciate all the comments and um, Thank you for everybody for the call, and uh, we we will be continuing this on the February 25th at 
7.05 or a little bit after 7. And certainly if there's any more questions or comments, um, feel free to, uh, to keep them coming. We have, I do have the comments that were sent over before, so thank you very much. I think I don't know if there's anything else. Cool. Okay. okay. At this point, if there's nothing else, uh, we're Pleasure. going to, if somebody would like to make a motion to... Make a motion to end the meeting. Okay. Josh has made a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Scott has second that. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll start with Karen. Aye. All right. Scott. Aye. Uh, Jason. Be gone. Jason, are you there? Get that black screen up and muted. He, he must have. Uh, okay. <laughs> aye. All right. And David, aye. Okay. All right, everybody All right. have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Have Very a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> and we're out. Night.